Hey up everyone, welcome to Yorkshire Gamers, a Reap Big War Games podcast, and episode 29. Uh, this is going to be part two of the summer special of Brews in the Binyard, uh, of which uh, episode 28 was the first part. And if you remember... In that uh, episode, we we had a little bit of an introductory chat with uh, Sean Clark, God's Own Scale, and Alex Sutheran, my uh, compadres in uh, Brews in the Binyard. Caught up on where they were with their channels and uh, podcasts. And uh, then we had a little bit of a light-hearted review of all the other entries into War Games Room 101. And um, we drifted off um, on a few occasions, as I'm, I'm sure you used to. Uh, we were on about the comparative investigation skills of Eddie Street Shoestring and uh, Miss Marple, which I'm sure you all enjoyed very much. As it's only a week since the previous episode, there's uh, not much to cover in the housekeeping section. The episode uh, of Battle Games that I recorded with Henry Hyde, um, which was done the night after this recording, um, is now out and, uh, and available on Henry's Patreon. And uh, a great time was had. I really enjoyed that. It's uh, it's great talking to other podcasters because you um, you kind of come in from the same um, angle at the at the job, and you know that both of you are going to have something to say. When you interview people, there's always going to be a repeat of a story or something like that. You know, I'm 29 episodes in now and I'm going to tell stories that I've told in other episodes. You know, I'm not like a comedian writing fresh material for each episode. So my apologies if I do that. It's, you know, I'm having a conversation with somebody that I haven't spoken to before in most cases and they might not have heard that story. This might be the first time you've listened to this podcast, so you might not have heard it. And um, I try to make these podcasts as interesting and as funny and uh, accessible to everyone, even though they're based around big games. So I hope you enjoy this. I hope you enjoy my chat with Henry. And um, I hope you enjoy the second part of the Brews in the Binyard summer special. And as usual with Brews in the Binyard, I've gone out to all the listeners, readers, viewers on um, the various Yorkshire Gamer formats and also on Sean's God's Own Scale Facebook group and Alex's uh, Storm of Steel uh, group. Um, just to get some questions, and we, we had some really, really good ones, and um, we had some gr- some great conversations. There's a few that I think were there maybe to try and start a fight with us, um, but we uh, it, amazingly we actually agreed on uh, virtually uh, everything. So it was a great discussion, a great chat, lots of uh, rabbit holes that we dive down as we usually do. But I think if you're here listening to this, you kind of know how brews in the binyard works. So. Sit back, get us in a cup of tea, relax and enjoy us talking rubbish about wargaming. Without further ado, here's an interview. Right, so here we go, here we go, downhill stretch. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God! <laughs> What else would you be doing, Alex? (laughs) What else would you be doing? Uh, uh, I don't know, slamming my dick in the fridge door? That'd be more pleasurable. (laughs) You've got to leave that in, Ken. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, dear. And welcome back. Welcome back. back. To the friendly podcast. With no swearing that's child-friendly. (laughs) <laughs> um, but nobody under the age of 35 actually listens to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Self-policing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And we'll, we'll be talking about ladies' problems later on for our <laughs> zero percentage of the <laughs> Anyway, so um, we've got uh, our questions for Ask Our Nora and our lovely uh, fans from um, all our... Um, channels put some questions forward which was lovely um and I, I don't want to disappoint you but i'm going to send this earlier um say this early on we haven't got any questions as good as last time in that we haven't got anyone asking which our favorite version of only you is whether it's the flying pickets <laughs> or your zoo 
Um, always we, the flying pickets, obviously. Always the fly, yeah. Um, <laughs> didn't we discuss that? I thought that the, they looked like they'd all been on heroin. This is this <laughs> the is the time pickets. when I feel young. Yeah. <laughs> they'd so like, I'm in the old old folks' home. Yeah, the, the 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 flying pickets never went on tour. They just kept getting moved on. <laughs> <laughs> That's a that's a joke for the old people. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So, uh, so we've got some controversial stuff in here, uh, some straightforward stuff, and some stuff that I haven't got a clue what they're on about. Um, but we'll we'll work our way through it. And uh, first up is Sean Camponi from Facebook, and um, he is asking, "What are your favourite First World War rule sets, both skirmish and battalion level?" I don't play any. I, I don't play any skirmish games, so I'm got a clue. Um, um, and my bata- my battalion level would be if the law spares us, because that's the only World War One game I play. Uh, I'll name a set that Alex is very familiar with: Square Bashing by Peter Pig. <laughs> uh, that is a divisional level game, I suppose. Um, you're you're certainly playing with a division on the table. Um, very straightforward, very quick, uh, no nonsense. Uh, gives a good result in a reasonable amount of time. Copes with most aspects of First World War warfare, I think, uh, from trenches through to the open, uh, more open manoeuvre of the early months of the war. I would also say Great War Spearhead, um, but I haven't actually played them yet. <laughs> I've got the, <laughs> I've got the rules. Um, oh, when I say I haven't played them yet, I, I sort of have played them, but I haven't played any of the larger scenarios. Uh, they're a bit more old school, traditional war game rules, I would suggest. Um, for mm. skirmish, I can't really comment. To be honest, I've uh, I can't really, I've not really played any skirmish gaming. I think you have, haven't you, Alex? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll pick up there. Um, yeah, square bashing, hundred uh, percent. One of my favourite games. I love it. It said uh, never had a disappointing game of square bashing. Uh, second edition, anyway. Um, really good. Uh, well worth getting into, and uh, just good fun. And uh, for skirmish, there's none better than Through the Mud and Blood by the Two Far Lardies. Uh, there's, to be honest, from my point of view, there's no point playing anything else. Uh, not just because there's Two Far Lardies, but it is uh, very much based on the uh the the tactics of the time you know it's uh they go out of the way at the at the back of the book to talk about the different armies and the different tactics they were using down at platoon level and most other first world war skirmish games that i've seen uh just don't ignore all that they've got it, it's just like oh it's a 10 man squad you know and that's that's mm-hmm. it it's like you know 40k but in first world war and they seem to actually ignore any of the uh the work that's been done on the on the First World War in the last fifty years, really. Uh, so yeah, it's um, yeah, without a doubt. Um, there's lots of friction in it. There's uh, a lot of nice little bits and pieces in there. It's it's like it's like uh, sharp practice, but for the First World War, uh, but within within its own confines. Yeah, so they're, I need they're to look that up. Too. I think it seems to be now that World War One gaming um, is relatively common um it didn't certainly didn't used to be it used to be that somebody a lot of people just went i'm not going anywhere near that it's picking up a lot of traction i've noticed in the last couple of years um the guys that did blood and thunder blood and plunder sorry they they put something out blood and valor i think it's called Mm. i've not played it but one of the guys down the club james he's he's played it uh he likes it a lot i've not actually looked at the rules of themselves but um yeah, I don't know what I don't know what they like, uh, but yeah, I'd, I'll just say for the amount of historical detail in it, through the mud and blood by the two fat lardies, hands yeah. down. Yeah, that seems really. to be the set that sort of brought it to the fore. Mm. Um, I don't remember anyone. So, I mean, at our club playing World War One prior to that set of rules. Yeah, uh, very good, very good. Indeed. I don't have many claims. I don't have many claims to fame either. But my photograph is in the square bashing rule set. And if you can oh. find me, I'll, I'll have sign a look the copy you. for I'll you. Have a look this. <laughs> <laughs> wow! But I have, um, I did have a copy of Great War Spearhead, but I just couldn't. I thought I found it too turgid to read. I just couldn't get through it at all. 
Uh, and to me, you know, one thing with rules is they may be very good, but if you can't read them, I'm just going to give up. I think it is one of those sets where you would benefit from playing with somebody who knows the rules rather than oh, trying yeah, to yeah, read them sure. in isolation. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, through the blood and the through the mud and the blood does interest me uh, after watching mm-hmm. your videos, Alex. So yeah, it is. Uh, it's on the to do list. Definitely. It's one of those games where because it's a two fat lord. Is if you use the tactics of the time, you will be successful. You know that's very much what their games are based on. They're, that's why they say play the period, not the not the rules. Yeah. It's about yeah. it's about the period, and this is very much steeped in period um, uh, ethos, I suppose. And do you use your square bashing figures for that, or have you got individual? No, I just got a lot of uh, individually based ones. But you yeah. could use square bashing ones for it. Oh, another good one actually. I've just thought is uh, Trench Hammer by um, uh, Nordic Weasel uh, Ivan Sorensen. Uh, that's like a layer below through the mud and blood, so it's not a full platoon. It might just be a couple of sections, but that's good as well. That's good fun, nice and easy, quick game. Uh, but it's yeah, it's, um, uh, you probably have to find it on World Games Vault. I think it's on there. Mm-hmm. But we've had some successful, good games of that. Good. Well, Sean um, Camponi and asker of the question, we might have actually answered your question there which um, could be a first for this uh, particular <laughs> brand of the podcast. It won't last. It won't last. Um, so, um, Simon Stokes on Facebook. Um, met Simon at uh, Parties Ad, lovely lad. Um, which of these two troubling circumstances would worry you the most? Um, the figures you bought but never got round to painting, or the figures you bought and painted but never have and never will use in a game? Well, you see, I don't have the that la- problem because I just buy figures that I'm not going to use. Yeah, you're quite frugal. Well, not yeah, you're a Yorkshireman. You're frugal. Um, you can, you can, <laughs> Short you can, arms, long pockets. Yeah, you kind of buy what you you kind of buy what you paint, what you play, don't you? Yeah, pretty much. I try to anyway. There's there's not much in my collection that hasn't at least been on the table once, and there's not much in my my painting mountain either, because I'll generally paint what I've got and then I'll buy something new in. Yeah, I mean, I think I've explained this on here a number of times. The the painter collector is the big thing for me. So um, I did a a couple of Roman legions in twenty eight mil a couple of years ago. Never been on the table. So, but does but it matter? I, but no, I'm, I you know, and I'm quite happy with the with the collecting side of it. So yeah, yeah. Eventually, we'll get around to doing something with them, but. Yeah. yeah, I'm really not that bothered. And um, over the years, I've I've kind of reduced my painting uh, lead pile quite considerably. Um, yeah. So I, I'm very much the same as you at the moment, Alex. I, you know, this this Italian Wars of Independence project, I've bought it and I've painted it as I've gone along. So you know, I haven't got that many figures lying around. Mm. So Sean, your uh, confession. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this silence. Is, uh, silence. <laughs> it's, there's, a, uh, there's a massive. You can't see it because you're listening to this, but there's a massive heap of, of figures behind Sean that are just <laughs> unpainted. I'm sat on them actually. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah th- this has really been a downfall. So to answer the question, it would be the second one where I've painted something and not used it because I, I paint to play. Uh, mm. Not not display. I, I don't take particular pleasure in having a collection just for the sake of it. So I will paint figures to play with them. Now I have painted figures with the intention of playing with them, but not actually played with them, and that does stress <laughs> me out because I think I've put all this effort into painting these figures, and and yet I haven't managed to get them to the table. Um, and also, I am very ill-disciplined when it comes to buying <laughs> figures for... Uh, I, I'm an impulsive purchaser. So I might not purchase buy any figures for months, but then suddenly a fever grips me. 
<laughs> and uh, the monster uh, rises. The monster <laughs> the rises, and, yeah. and yeah, and suddenly inspiration has struck that says to me, "I am going to be able to paint three thousand figures that I've just bought uh, and get them on the table in about six months." And in fact, there's a real, real aspect of confession to this now, um, and I'm, I'm going to say it now because I like to think I'm amongst friends. I might not be once I've finished saying what I've got to say now. There's, there's nobody <laughs> else listening, Sean. Yeah. It's just me and Ken. It's just me and Ken. There's nobody else listening. <laughs> I, uh, I've i bought some 40K figures. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. With Ban the him, intention Ken. Ban him. of painting and playing with them. Um, <laughs> just because I've, I've just... I don't know. I don't know why I've done it. I've always enjoyed... Is this, this... Oh. Is this Horus Heresy? Heresy? No, it wasn't Horus Heresy. (laughs) It was the Horus Heresy, but I've actually cancelled the order today (laughs) because I I put the order in for that big box set. Mm. Um, But I've seen sense and cancelled that. But I do still have some 40k (laughs) figures that I bought uh, with the intention of painting and and playing with them. Um, uh, I've always enjoyed the background to 40k, the the lore and the novels. as a science fiction setting. Mm. Uh, and I thought, why not? And I, I just went and did well, it. Is, it um, is pretty fleshed out, isn't it, at this point, I think. it's uh, Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's practically a, a, a world in itself. But yeah, at the end of the day, you know, it's your, it's your thing, isn't it? If, you, if that's what you want to do, you weirdo, then crack on. <laughs> uh, I, I may already... <laughs> <laughs> my my lad's back from university, and I've I've um, begged a uh, Primaris Space Marine. Am I in the right area? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he, I've begged one of their, them off him because I'm going to resurrect the technically bit of Space Marines. <laughs> <laughs> when I, when there'll be a whole them. new, there'll be a whole generation of people that have, have, have yet to be offended by that, Ken. So exactly. Crack on with well, it. what we could do is we could do, we could do a Bruise of the Binyard display game. <laughs> Tetley bit of space I've, I've by whatever you've bought. <laughs> and He's when I've, I'm under the coated, I'm I'm showing a space marine to the the other guys. When I, I undercoated that, I he's thought... He's not, he's not, listeners, he's yeah. showing us something else. Yeah. Ooh, That's not he's, a space a, he's a big lad. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking he looks a bit shriveled, that, to be honest. Is it cold away? You don't see him that big very often, do you? <laughs> um, but, to, sorry, to get, to get back on point, to answer that question yeah. from that sorry, listener... Si- sorry, si- sorry, Simon Stokes. <laughs> yeah, but yes. We're trampling I, all over uh, your question. I, I, I struggle more with that second part where I've, I've painted figures and then don't get to use them because uh, I, I do I do paint to play, not to display. So after success, after successfully answering the first answer, we've <laughs> ruined the second one. But yeah, I'm I'm I, I'm a bit like you, Ken. I, I enjoy I enjoy the painting as much mm. as the playing. So if I don't get to use figures, then you know it doesn't really matter because I've enjoyed painting them. I enjoy painting. I do enjoy. I, you know, I'm sitting down painting some 15 mil British figures for the Sudan at the moment. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah but uh, I, that's with the fully with the intention that I'm going to play with them. Yeah, yeah. Not just put them on the shelf. <laughs> so, uh, apologies, Simon, for that potential part of an answer that went on for ages. <laughs> so, um, that didn't actually clear anything up. Yeah. Uh, but there we go. I think by now people are aware that if they put questions in, they might not they're not going to get answered. They're unlikely yeah. to get an answer. Yeah. 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 We'll, be t- we'll be talking about all sorts of technically bit of space marines. How did we get to that? How did we get to that? Right. So, Ken, Ken Baldock on Facebook. Uh, how many periods, scales, and rules is it normal to own? <laughs> All of them, Ken. All of them. <laughs> Ken is the eccentric. If you don't know, Ken's the eccentric man over on YouTube. Check mm. him out. Um, it's got the best theme song to YouTube channel ever. He has, yeah. Groundhog's yeah. fantastic. Great yeah, band. I love that. Mm. Well, I think Alex, uh, you're, you're the you're the most restrained of all of us because you you don't do anything. <laughs> Spear Chucky wise, do you? you? 
No, my yeah, you're my. Do you not a swords and sandals guy? Not at all. My 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 interest in wargaming are, are generally powered by my interest in history. Mm. I've kind of come to realise this, and my interest in history are generally the first, second world wars, and the Napoleonic Wars. Mm. That's what I'm interested in. I've got very little interest in 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 other wars outside of that. You know, I, I, about our passing interest. You know, what I mean, mm. in military history throughout the ages, but uh, I can't get any enthusiasm for other other things. I mean, there's there's so much to go on on those three in, alone that you know you spend your life researching them and never you'll still always find something new. So I I kinda I try to keep my things within within my historical interests and that so that's where my wargaming is. And then also even even with scales and there's a reason for it again because I'm a tight Yorkshireman. I like mm. to keep at fifteen mil because I can use the scenery, you know, from eighteen fifteen up to nineteen forty five because, you know, buildings a lot of buildings are still the same, you know what I mean, from uh, from then. Uh, like Hougamon Farm is still around, isn't it? La Haye Saints is still around. So, you know, they were re- they were there in the Second World War and the First World War. And, and, they weren't fought yeah. over, obviously, but, you know, that style yeah. of building was, and then, was and then, then at the end of 1945, wasn't the Americans had landscaped most of Western Europe. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, there's, a, there's a cut-off point there, yeah. <laughs> Because somebody, I I did a live stream I think yesterday was it Tuesday and uh, someone was asking me if I was getting into Cold War Commander, the new one. A lot of people have been getting really interested in that, and I've seen a lot of people posting stuff about it. And and Cold War, excuse the pun, just leaves me cold. I've just got mm. no interest in it. And I and I wouldn't and I think that's possibly because it's I grew up with it in the background. You know, yeah. I, I grew up in the eighties. The Cold War was still raging till the end of the eighties, and. Uh, and, and to, so to me, it's not history. It's it's, it's almost, it, you know, it's my life. I'm not that interested in recreating the the 1980s in 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 Eastern Germany. No, no. And, but 40 and, years earlier, I'm all over it. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, looking on on my periods of history, I, I've I've done a bit of ancients. I think Dark Ages. I've got ancients, and then I've got Crusades, and then. Italian wars, so there's a few big mm. gaps there. Uh, but after that, you name it, I've Malburian, Seven Years' War, Napoleonic, American Civil War, Italian Wars of Independence, World War One, World War Two, moderns. I've mm. got all of it. But yeah, like it's interesting because I, I was thinking about it again the other day because you just mentioned the Dark Ages, and I'm actually really interested in it, but from an archaeological point of view. So I'm really interested in Vikings. But not so much mm. from a warfare point of view, from their their archaeological, um, from yeah, from you know, from from their uh, their expansions and things. And there were you know, there weren't really any great battles anyway, apart mm. from the great army in the eight hundreds. Uh, most of it would have been small skirmishes anyway. So I mean, I'm interested in Vikings, but I don't do. The, I've got some Vikings for wargaming, but I. I've played. I could count on on my hand how many on my fingers how many. Uh, actual Viking skirmish games I've played, you know, with those figures I've got. I just got them because I'm interested in Vikings. I'm more You've interested done a battle in report, haven't you, with the Vikings, Alex? I did. I did it on the uh, on Thiggy, on uh, Raven. Uh, Raven what's Feast. it called? Raven? Ra- Raven Feast. Feast. Yeah, the Little Wars Feast. Fist. Feast. <laughs> uh, the one uh, the Little Wars puts out. I just thought I'll do a, a battle report on that. And it was good fun. You know, it was a great, great fun little game. Um, there was a few rules I changed in it, but it was an introductory game for people to get into wargaming and it works and I just thought I'd do a video on it. So yes, I've used them, but very rarely have I uh, have they come out of the box. You yeah. know, it's cuz I'm just not that bothered about it. I I bought I bought uh, Ducks Britannarium after playing it with Jeremy Short on uh, one of the virtual lord games. Uh, while we were playing, I was enjoying it so much that I went and bought everything. And then Realised I just had no interest in the period whatsoever, so I sold it all <laughs> off. <laughs> but I enjoyed the game, you know. I enjoyed playing the game, but uh, it wasn't something that I wanted to put any effort in on my part. You know, I'd be happy to sit you, down and play games. Is it that um, if somebody put anything on down at the club, you would take part in it, but you just don't want to collect it yourself, or you've got no interest in playing any games anywhere? No, no, no. Uh, yeah, because t- tomorrow night. Um, and my mate Dean's bringing some six mil crusaders down. We're going to play uh, some game that he wants to try out 
so yeah, I'm more than happy to play. And we've been playing Strength and Honor, and I really enjoyed that, the Ancients game. Uh, you know, I collected a load of stuff for Infamy uh, and then sold it all on. <laughs> but uh, and and I played quite a few other games um, down at the club. You know, stuff that I wouldn't normally play. But it's just like you say, it's just stuff that I'm not particularly interested in collecting myself. If somebody wants to put on a game, uh, I'm more than happy to play it. Uh, just because I'd try it out, but whether you know I'm going to collect it afterwards is a completely different matter. Mm. Sean, I think you're the only one who's not fessed up. <laughs> uh, a bit like <laughs> yourself, Ken. To be honest, um, a lot of my war game over the last fifteen to twenty years has been based around Peter Pig uh, figures and rules. Just help mm. because I'm friends with the guys and. Helped out with a bit of playtesting. So every time they've brought out a set of rules, I've ended up with at least two armies. Uh, <laughs> so I can uh, put the game on down at the club, sometimes more than two armies. Uh, I think I've got six or seven armies for square bashing. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Having this diversity of periods, because I've, I have this theory that if, if you're into one period... Uh, you can spend 100% of your hobby time doing that period. If they then branch out into a second period, the very most you can do of both is 50%, but likely mm. the new period will take over most of your time, so you might do 90% of that and 10%. And then add in another period, and you di- dilute your hobby time more and more mm-hmm. and more, where you're able to, to look at any one particular period that you're interested in. Now, for yourself, Ken, as a collector, then that doesn't particularly matter because you, you're painting your Italian uh, wars, uh, sorry, your War of Independence stuff now, um, and you may play a couple of games with it and then put it on the shelf and then not look at it again for years. Um, but for me, I, I like to see value for money in the figures that I buy. Hey, oh, bit of Yorkshire coming out in him. <laughs> yeah, well, um, and and the fact that I'm going to get some enjoyment out of them, and I, I do find myself thinking, well, I've, I've concentrated on this so much, but I haven't looked at these for years, and then I suddenly get the urge then to sell it because mm. I think, well, I, I've not, I know, I know, I haven't played with it for so long. I've ju- I'm just resisting now selling a load of 15 mil once again. Um, I, I need, well, I sort of had a buyer for a large collection of 15 mil, but uh, I've, I've pulled back again because I know I'll have a seller's regret as soon as they go because I know how much time and effort is put into painting them. Um, so whether you can have too many periods, I don't think so. I've just sort of countered that argument by saying, well, you probably can, but <laughs> I, 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 I do like having the collections, but I like to play with them. I don't mm. get an intrinsic value out of just having the collection. I like to be able to yeah. think that. I, I, you know, maybe once, it might be just once a year I get my Spanish Civil War figures out and have a game with them. Or my ACW naval stuff. And have if I can get one game per year with the vast majority of my collection, I would be happy. I don't do that yeah. at the moment, but if I ever could, I, I, I would aspire to that. To follow on to that, I think the problem is as well, like you say with Sean, is we, you're not just diluting the the figures that you're using you're also diluting the rules that you're using if you if you buy lots of different systems because you don't you never seem it feels like you don't scratch the surface if you play a different set of rules like say for example at the club every week uh, there's yeah. a different somebody's playing a different games like okay you, you 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 have to play games to learn the games in yeah. most cases you know and and you have to play them quite a few times to learn them so that I, that's another thing I like to concentrate on are just a few rule sets. You know, I did. They're, they're generally based within my interests, but they, I like to to really hone in on the rules and really get an understanding of them. So for years, you know, we played rapid fire, uh, uh, and we knew it inside out, and you know that's what we enjoy playing. And now I'll play something else, but I, I, I will, you know, really hang on to that, that that set of rules and, and play it a lot rather than like you say it's you're almost diluting your your gaming experience uh, i think having, a set of rules you know, like chain of command definitely mm. uh re, repays repeated play doesn't it 
you, or you, yeah, sorry, you get more yeah. from the rules the more you play with them. I, I yeah, played yeah. one game of Chain of Command and enjoyed it, but I suspect I'd enjoy it a hell of a lot more if I played it more frequently because I get to know the mechanisms and then you get you get into the tactics far there's, more. And there's a lot more nuance in, in games like Chain of Command that you don't pick up straight away from a. Yeah. You know, from a, I don't want to turn every interview I ever do in, into an advert for Chain of Command, but I mean, it is by far the best game out there. And if you've got any arguments about it, I'll fight you in the in the car park. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, I, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's like that in particular. Chain of Command is a really good example because a lot of people will play it and they say that they, they dismiss it because it ended up in a long range firefight. Well, that's because you're not using the game as the game is intended and you're not doing the things you know, we were talking about it the other day in the pub. Uh, and, and and you just have to you have to but you have to play it several times more times than just that one off yeah. at a club and then then and not again for another four weeks you know you have to keep playing it quite a few times and there's quite a few games I mean it's it's not the only one there is quite a few games that do have those nuances in them that you don't pick up on a first on a first play yeah. uh, so again you know you going for lots of different systems as nice as the new shiny might be it's you know, does it really does it do you any favors as a as a gamer? Mm. But it's like everything, isn't it? In world gaming, you know, each of their own. If if somebody wants to buy something new and play something new every week, then you know, I'm not going to stop them. No, I just won't do it. So um, there is no um, rule period scales rules apart from no. my rule: one period, one skill scale. The only thing I do is <laughs> um, like ACW six mil. I'm not having 15 mil and 28 mil as well. If you get one shot, unless it's World War Two, and then I've got 28 mil early war, 15 mil <laughs> mid war, and six mil late war. Let's just brush over that, shall we? <laughs> yeah, well, they are three different wars in themselves, aren't they? The exactly. Early, mid, exactly. and late. Exactly. Um, so, uh, thank you, Ken. Um, John Sowerby from Facebook. Is there a time period or campaign that you wish people would stop bringing stuff out for? Any <laughs> periods or campaigns that are totally overexposed? In the Second World War, I would probably say Normandy. Uh, everything is Normandy orientated, and that's not. I'm not slagging off Normandy there, but you know, and it's a fun. It's a fun thing to to, to play, but it just seems everything is. You know, a new set of houses has come out, or they're all in Normandy. Mm. You know, a, a new a new set of uh, figures have come out, or they're all based in Normandy. You know, there, there's so much more to explore in the Second World War than just that Northwest Europe mm. uh, area in that very short period of time as well. You know, and I, I think that to me, that's probably that is probably the big one. I think there seems to be a like gateway into every single period. Um, mm. The from a commercial point of view, you know, if you're bringing Napoleonics out, Waterloo, make French, yeah, Waterloo. make French, Fr- French, uh, make Imperial Guard, and you'll you'll sell yeah, thousands exactly. of them. Exactly. Um, you know, you're not going to you sell know, the Hanoverians, are you? Yeah. Or the uh... medieval <laughs> Ashenkor, yeah, um, ancients, Romans versus Gauls. Uh, these are the ones that are going to bring you money. As a, as a commercial enterprise, yeah, whereas yeah. twenty eight mil papal troops from the Italian Wars of Independence, <laughs> not a lot yeah. really. You know the stuff I've shown today. I've had to use Argentinian cavalry from the Triple Wars, <laughs> the Triple Alliance, uh, and a bit of green stuff and a bit of filing, um, <laughs> and not too close up photographs. <laughs> to get it to work um but yeah i think um like you say alex world war Two, normandy the russian campaign for 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 war gamers tends to be pushed to one side Very um, much so. and, and certainly the, the you know the desert campaign and the early war as well mm. um and the far east and the far, far east, yeah, yeah far east god yeah. yeah um unless it's island hopping yeah yes yeah yeah, yeah. Because you, you've got your... Is it Malaya your set-up, Alex? It, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, Big it into Malaya. looks like a fish tank, that one. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it, got, it got all... We were down at... Um, well, you were there as well, Sean, at uh, Crackcom. 
uh, and I went upstairs, but I can't remember where Alex was putting away or setting up, and he got all his terrain in a really useful box. I thought, fuck me, he's bought some fish. <laughs> <laughs> I had to put the fish back in it later on <laughs> when I got home, filled it back with water. <laughs> I got my bag sat on the side when all day. That's yeah. why I needed to get home. <laughs> <laughs> Feed the I've, I've run out of fish. They don't do uh, fish flakes down the chippy in um, Derby. Put mushy mushy peas, chips, and, and a haddock. And can I have a side of fish flakes, please? So I, I'd, yeah. I'd agree with that. I think um, immediately coming to mind is Napoleonics. It's not a great love of mine. Napoleonics isn't, but uh, it seems like every month there's a new range of French fusiliers uh, comes out or something else for the Waterloo campaign. Um, I won't go on to the topic of Warlord Games epic uh, scale <laughs> figures. Uh, the 13.275 83 mil. It still hurts, doesn't it, Sean? It still hurts. Well, <laughs> it just rankles that it's, they chose... The Waterloo campaign, and obviously when they did the American Civil War, it was Gettysburg, <laughs> because there wasn't any other battle during the American Civil War other than Gettysburg to do buildings. Yeah, but for. which is the one that everybody knows? Well, this is the yeah. I mean, clearly as a commercial decision, that's great. Yeah, but that's all it is. You're a little. It's the same with Normandy, isn't it? It's what yeah, everybody yeah, yeah. knows. Oh, Not absolutely. Many people know yes, about yeah, yeah. Uh, the Malaya campaign. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, yeah, you're not going to sell like uh, Australians in, in the Radcourt, Far East, but uh, um, eighth, it, yeah, it just eighth infantry, are you anything? Yeah, yeah, the, the uh, it just rankles with me too. as a grognard of the hobby who's been in it for a long time. I'd like it to must see be, something. It must be that people fresh. are coming into the hobby to buy this though, um, because you know the. You know, I've done war, played Waterloo so many times, and I haven't done it for a long time. But is there a drive there to do it again? Not really. Um, but you know, I'd 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 quite happily play a lot of the eighteen thirteen campaign games and uh, some of the Peninsula games that I haven't played um, in in lieu of that. So uh, there's clearly people coming in, and it, like you say, it's a commercial decision. So people are buying it, and you know, whatever comes out next, epic. If it's medieval, as we said, it'll be Agincourt. Um, English Civil War, Edgehill or um, Naseby. Or Naseby. Yeah, I, the thing is as well, you got to think, I mean, Warlord are, they're like the Games Workshop of, of historical wargaming, aren't they? Mm. They are They are the, the gateway into it. Like, you know, people play Bolt Action, they play Black Powder, uh, and now they play the epic stuff, you know, and it's probably stuff that they wouldn't have even thought about playing, but because... Uh, Warlord is selling it, it opens them up to, to new things. So, mm. although, yes, you know, there are a lot of things that are over oversubscribed when it comes to theatres uh, and particular periods and things, I don't think it's a particularly bad thing because you don't have to play them if you don't want to. You know? No, but I think I, I just wonder if what the grab would be. Waterloo is essentially three months of a 20 year war. Um, and something like Penin the Peninsula campaign, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, you could tie into the Richard Sharp thing. Okay, there might be ro royalty issues there, but you know everybody knows about <laughs> Sharp and chosen men in the Peninsula. Um, and I just think there's so much more variety that you could get from if if they'd set it in the Peninsula. Um, but again, I'm, I'm just not yes, thought, I, I suppose. So just be about it. <laughs> but again, how many how many people who've who've not who have no idea of history or who have got no no idea of of historical war game and have heard of the Peninsula campaign? Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. You know, I, it, I, I just think people should try harder. <laughs> yeah. Lazy war gamers. Lazy Get good. War gamers. Get yeah, good. Yeah. yeah um, and the next question is is on a similar line but slightly different take um, from Mark Hydes on uh, Facebook. Hi, Mark. Um, is there a formerly niche period that you wish still was? Because it's become over. Is there a period that you just wish would just fuck off? 
<laughs> I was going to say I... Mexican Revolution up until you say that bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm going, to, I'm going to be controversial here. I'm going to say Italian Wars because everyone's everyone's doing it now. Yeah, it seems to have gained popularity, yeah, doesn't it? It's it 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 like just me. <laughs> That's when else. I liked it. Nobody I don't else. like it anymore. I'm selling everything. It's like bastards. bastards. This time next year, everyone's going to be doing the Resorgimento. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm waiting for the two fat ladies to put their uh, Far East book out, and then everybody will be doing Malaya, and I'll I'll suck all my stuff off. <laughs> yeah, like, you're uh, doing Normandy, uh, won't you? <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, nothing, there's nothing like a good niche period of history that nobody knows anything about. <laughs> um, and then, because I, I have to, I've got to be honest. I'm running out of periods of history now. I'm, I'm, in, <laughs> I'm in my, I'm in my mid fifties. I'm, I'm just shy of thirty thousand figures. And Why there's not, Christ. there's not a lot left. To be honest, Sumerians. <laughs> have you got any Sumerians? I, no. I, what, what are they? What do they do? They've got donkeys, haven't they, or something? They got, on yeah, the chest, he, is it? Yeah, go way, way, way back. Go like Neolithic. Yeah. Oh, nobody, nobody war games are Neolithic. The no. Paleolithic. Go on, hunter gatherer warfare. <laughs> nobody does that. Yeah, but there's not many big battles, was there? Yeah. Well, it's, it's 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 all about relativity, isn't it? There wasn't many people around, so you know. <laughs> Still have a big table, people, just not many figures. <laughs> yeah, five people would be a big battle. <laughs> yeah. You're missing, you're missing my game. You're like 20% of the population, <laughs> that would. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, but I like big in numbers of figures, not big in percentage of population. <laughs> I think, I think you're just, just you're not that thinking question, hard enough. I, th- I think to answer that question, the hobby went through a period in the, I would say, the 90s, uh, pushed by War Games Illustrated, where for a period of time it was all cowboys. And then it was all pirates. And then it was all darkest Africa. You couldn't move for articles to do with those mm. uh, three topics in, in the War Games Illustrated of the mid to late 90s, I would suggest. Uh, and I certainly got fed up of seeing War Games Foundry adverts for darkest Africa or uh, the, you know the pirates at the time. But as, I, I'm not sure there is a niche period at the minute. Yeah, okay, Italian, uh, sorry, um, Italian Wars of Independence is definitely niche, but I think it's so niche, it's not yeah. really a niche. No, it barely exists, what? other what? than in your head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is good. Yeah, did it even happen? Then, until they come on and go, oh, you've got your flag wrong. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason you don't like it, is because if somebody else knows something about it, they can tell yeah. you you've got it wrong. <laughs> Yeah, and they, and, they, and, they, and they can because I'm blagging it. I haven't got a clue. I haven't got a clue yeah. what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> Some bloke called Garibaldi, and he had a red shirt. And he used to hit, he used to hit people with a big stick. Something, something to do with biscuits. And I said, and he, and he, he said Rome or death about three times, and he actually did neither of them. <laughs> the crusade seems to be taking off a bit. I don't uh, for some reason. The that's Crusades. My, that'll be my stuff as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, no, You've got a lot to answer for, Ken. It's, it's surprising. <laughs> I'm just thinking political correctness-wise, the Crusades, you couldn't really get much more troublesome in terms of, you know, because it's just people from different religions hacking each other's heads off, isn't it? Yeah. Really. yeah. Mm. Um, and things like Darkest Africa. I mean, yeah, yeah, know, that was a pretty yeah, horrific yeah. period of time, isn't it? The yeah, yeah, colonial yeah. expansion into Africa with the the Belgians and the uh, the British uh, Empire thing. You know, there's it's pretty controversial stuff now. I'm, I'm not sure that that sort of range would do very well these days. I, no, think I don't think too it would. Much yeah, political sensibility around it. Yeah, I think yeah, within I, agree, the, I, I think, think within the war games hobby, it, it's fairly acceptable it's it's a discussion point but i think if if somebody from outside the hobby came in and saw it yeah yeah i think i think there would be questions, questions asked without so so there we go mark um everything um should be banned um, <laughs> and it's all Ken's another, fault. And it's all another fault. really well answered question there well done, uh, <laughs> well done everyone i think, well we, I think we might Gold have stands. had this one last time but uh, we'll, uh, 
Ian Bailey on Facebook. If you were restricted to only playing one period, what would it be? <laughs> Darkest Africa. Darkest, yeah. <laughs> Crusades. <laughs> six uh, six mil emu war. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Apparently, it's a my, really good game. That is, if you listen to the Hobby Support Group podcast with Andy and Tom, <laughs> they're big proponents of the Emu War. Yeah, but they they hate big gaming. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll pass on your uh, your regards, Ken, because I'm I'm uh, recording with them next oh, week. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> no, I do I do listen to some of them, but they did a. Oh, you're backtracking now. Yeah, backtracking. No, no, I do listen to some of them, but they did an episode um, about. I can't remember six mil war game or something like that before they had uh-huh. uh, and and all the old twenty eight mil stuff came out and um, I was in a car park at three o'clock in the morning having just been to a job uh, and I had to turn it off because I was getting angry. <laughs> <laughs> it was, oh, it's just it's just twelve men taking a flag for a walk and oh you can't do this battle in twenty eight mil. You can and I have lots of, ta- lots of times. <laughs> so anyway, no, they, they, they are good lads. It was just that one episode that I just went, hey, hang on a minute. <laughs> yeah, Flip muggers. the table. Yeah, muggers. Uh, so yeah, um, Italian wars for me. Mine would be World War Two, just because of the, the 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 vast array of things you can do in it. Yeah, and it would cost you a load of money to start something different. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, American Civil War, no surprise for me, I don't think. Yeah. Right, next question. Next question. Ooh, <laughs> this has gone over to. That was easy. Oh, this, is, this is a double. This is a double question. One of them, one of which is uh, Dex McHenry on Facebook. Um, how? Hi Dex. Oh, hi Dex. He's, he comes down to our club. Oh, does he? Yeah. Uh, oh, you can give, give him a dig in the ribs for this then. Uh, what's oh, the best good. approach to collecting war games miniatures? Sticking to one single scale or going for multiple scales? <laughs> what do you think, Sean? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> what a question! <laughs> so, I have uh, are there, in are there other scales apart from twenty eight mil that I've missed. Twenty five mil. Twenty five. Uh, uh, Thirteen point five. Thirteen point two three seven five two nine six. Thirty two mil now. Yeah, that's just that's just um, that's just big twenty eight though, isn't it? <laughs> that's on steroids. Um, Really, the sensible answer is is no. Stick to one scale. <laughs> However, I have six, ten, fifteen, and twenty-eight mil War of Independence. Six, <laughs> ten, fifteen, and twenty-eight mil World War Two. <laughs> Two mil, six mil, <laughs> ten mil. Do you know this thing we were mil. saying earlier about spreading yourself thin. Yeah, exactly. Well, there you go. <laughs> one period, one scale. Although, do you remember when War Games, not War Games Illustrated, miniature War Games back in the day, they used to do cover photographs and they'd have a 28 mil mm-hmm. figure or 25 mil figure yes, in the foreground. Yeah, yeah. Then there'd be a 15 mil figure in the background, then six mil yeah. further back, and it'd be this forced yeah. perspective. Never worked. It always looked shit. No, yeah, you can you could always <laughs> tell exactly how big the figures were. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, no, it's, it's the root of all madness, multiple scales for one period. Yeah, I would. You know, my I we've I kind of covered it earlier on. I I try to game as much as possible in fifteen mil, but I do have twenty eight and I do have six mil. But you know, for for various specific games, really. So yeah, I'm one one scale as much as possible. It just makes everything a lot easier. Mm. Yeah, terrain. No, and and terrain is the main one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You only need one set of terrain. Um, yeah, for for each one. Uh, so yeah, uh, there's a second part to that question, and uh, uh, Br- uh, given Bradford's recent accolade as the city of culture, <laughs> is war game a cultural activity? Now, as a, a near resident and Bradford and a supporter of Bradford City, how the bloody hell have we got <laughs> city of culture? I can only Don't think. Worry. I can only think that Hull, um, which is a, a medical experiment gone wrong. Um, has had it Hull, so Hull it, on Earth. it now must be our turn because it's a sympathy <laughs> vote yeah it is I mean other than the other than the fact that the city centre looks like 
something from Dresden from 1945 because it's an absolute bomb site. Um, <laughs> if you're away from there's a new shopping centre. If you go away from there, um, you know it's um, you, you can play the classic um, game of Alki or Baghead. Um, as, you, <laughs> as you walk down the road and look at the uh, the various people begging for money. So there we go. Anyway, um, there are some beautiful buildings in Bradford. It has there some are some fantastic, fantastic buildings art, in Bradford. Say, yeah. Unfortunately, most Lovely. of them it are boarded up place. and covered in pigeon shit. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Um, but yes. Uh, I would not. I would say it isn't a cultural activity. It's very much a niche hobby. Yeah, I don't think it's cultural. It it's grown men playing with toy soldiers at the end yeah. of the day. And as much as I, I love the hobby and I'm totally immersed in it, I would never consider it a cultural thing. Um, the acceptance of the hobby is is a bizarre one for me. That culturally. It seems more acceptable for a grown man to sit in his pants playing Call of Duty on his Xbox than it is for us to do what we do. And I think we are far more sophisticated because of the all the aspects that encompass wargaming. The research is that because we, we wear clothes when we play? <laughs> we, well, do you? Only on podcasts. <laughs> 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 uh, that's another question, but no, I, th- I, you know, I don't think we need to complicate the issue too much. It's uh, it's a pastime that takes up all of my time. Yeah, yes, I agree. I think yeah, I don't think it's cultural. It's fun, but it's not cultural. I mean, I think the only the only culture is probably what's growing on some of the war gamers. To be honest, <laughs> I met one of them at parties. Um. <laughs> all the. Um... Um, Just get a wash, lad. Yeah. The uh, uh, wet pallet in Martin's office <laughs> yeah, that yeah. Uh, had gone off. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's been destroyed. <laughs> the um, residue. There we go. Uh, quick question here from David Tuck on Facebook. Uh, Confused of Grimsby wants to know if avocado <laughs> is just poshy me- pea, mushy peas, <laughs> and it is, um, what does that make <laughs> my parents' 1970s avocado bathroom suite then? It wasn't avocado, it was mushy peas at a bathroom suite. Yeah. Going back to the introduction, it's in the bin yard and Alex is sat on the bog. Absolutely. There you go. That's, that's what it is. It's like, Billy, it's like Billy Connolly, this, isn't it? See what it's like poetry, it's it like, rhymes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, I'd, I'd just say that you. you your parents are tight and they haven't got a new bathroom suite yeah. for what, 50, 52 years. Get your hand in your pocket. There's a, fr- there's a free toilet down in this bin yard if you want it. It's the same, anyway. Right. Um, so we're on to Twitter now. Um, and our mate Sven, Sven Fulkerson. Uh, nice, Sven. Sven. Um, what should you think about when inviting wargaming strangers to your home for a game? <laughs> well, I've said this before. <laughs> I have a very big and slightly bitey German Shepherd. <laughs> so we kind of need to make sure <laughs> that you're not too tasty. <laughs> you know, if you're coming in with your arm covered in Hendo's relish, <laughs> it's gonna get. It's gonna I don't get even bit. know what Hendo's relish is. But Do you know? Oh, oh, oh it's food of the gods. Oh, food of the gods. Of it. It's oh, it's, it's amazing Worcester stuff. sauce for posh people. Yeah, <laughs> or, it's made, made here in Sheffield. Yeah, Worcestershire, Liam Perrins, all that. It's better than that. Yeah, it's way better. Yeah, in fact, we had a question on it. Relish. Yeah, we had a question on it last. <laughs> I don't know whether you get it in Stoke. You just probably not. <laughs> no, you're probably probably too far south. Yeah, doesn't travel well. Venereal like disease. That's, you get that in Stoke, but I don't think you'll get. Yeah, you won't. You won't get Hendo's. Uh, is it a cure for venereal disease? Could be. It, 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 it cure you for most things, I would think. Yeah, I think if you, I, th- I think if you sprinkled it on the infected parts, you get a reaction. I'm yeah, willing yeah, to definitely. give it a go. <laughs> right, we'll film. We'll, we'll film that for YouTube. 
<laughs> There's your 8,000 subscribers. Right, right straight there. up, yeah. Bam. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, no. Uh, I, what was the question? I, yeah, um, oh, God knows. What do you think about when inviting? <laughs> What's the more, question? Inviting more gaming strangers <laughs> to your home, and I, I, uh, I have to think about the dog. I would, I would have them vetted beforehand. Meet them at a neutral location, like a war gaming club or something. Well, I thought so you were going to say doggy lay by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, flash your lights at them. Yeah, <laughs> see if they react. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, sure. Uh, well, we surveillance team, first of all. Obviously. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah. It is quite a big thing bringing people round to your, to your house because I do most of my gaming here. Um, mm. So, you know, to bring somebody new in to the group, um, it's, it's a big ask, really, isn't it? Um, I think you have to know for quite well. Yeah. I mean, my yeah, my mates are the only ones that I game with in my in my house, and I know them well. Yeah. Uh, Same here. You know, having been gone to the club for a while now, I'd probably I'd be happy to have most people in the club to come to game because I know them well enough. But just somebody completely random and straight, like you know, who if you've met them on a I don't know on Twitter or something, might be a bit weird. But depends how long you've known them for Tinder. Yeah, Tinder for war gamers. <laughs> No, just just Tinder, just Tinder, just <laughs> Tinder. Yeah, I, def- I definitely would, would you know, if, if not the other one though. Somebody <laughs> from Facebook um, whose profile picture is a clown mask. <laughs> I think Alex is right. Invite them down to your local club if you've got one, um, and and see how they go. And um, it it is only really close friends that come to my house uh, to game not not for any snobbish reason i think but uh it's it's good to know who's going to be handling your figures and how mm. they cope with it and of the of the same mindset because I, I don't want to bring a win at all cost gamer back to my house and find out they throw a temper if i roll a six and they don't yeah and have yeah. to have to cut them up and put them in bin bags and yeah, take them down the set the dogs on them, them acid yeah. and feed them to the pigs Errol and all that sort of exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so Andy Shaw on Twitter are armyless a barrier hi Andy hi, are hi armyless Andy. a barrier to entry uh, can be uh, I, I, I saw Andy's be. I saw Andy's question I thought this was it's quite a good one it is. I, thought... I mean I don't use army lists and I, and I never have used army lists but I can see for, um, and I'm 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 talking sort of third hand here. Um, sort of bolt action. They took like a thousand point army and stuff like that. So you, there's kind of a minimum entry level um, for for people to have their own stuff. But with anything like this, I always say, go down to your local club, have a game with somebody else. There'll be somebody at that club who will be quite happy to lead you through a game of. Um, 28 mul- the ancient Egyptians versus Sumerians and um, if you like it you can buy your own stuff mm. I I don't think I don't think they're a barrier to, to, to entry I think well it's a bit of a different uh, thing is it depends on 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 how well written the army lists are mm. I think uh, I'll, if there's like a you know like a, a a basic army list in the back of the rules that is small enough for somebody who's just getting into the game to to try out I think I don't think they're a barrier because it's 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 kind of it's giving you a ready made here you are, this is what you'd need to play the game, you know, buy these and crack on. Uh but I think complicated army lists without examples can be a barrier because if you don't understand them, if you're a completely new player and you've never come across that kind of thing before, you you probably just won't you know, if they, they just give you a load of lists of uh, of of options and points, and say you know, play a five hundred point game. You, mm. Trying to work that out as a new player would be quite difficult, I think. But if they just said, "This is X amount of points worth of figures that you will need for the game. Here's your first army," kind of thing. I think that's a that's a good introduction to people. But that, for me, there's something wrong with any set of rules if you can't go. If you can't go 
a look at an historical order of battle and go, right, the unit size for this is 24 figures or whatever, and go down mm. an order of battle and pick a brigade or whatever and go, yeah. get that and battery of guns and that brigade of light cavalry. And if that doesn't fit into your army list, then your army lists are wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as that. And and you know you get a lot of times where people will talk about um, like king tigers and stuff like that, and having them in army lists, and and only having one or something like that. If if you see them, they're going to be a unit because you've got all the uh, mechanical stuff behind it. You've got highly technical sections that can only fix king tigers so mm-hmm. you, you can't have them one here and one 20 mile away you need to have them concentrated so you either have 20 or none yeah so there we go so they can be i think they can be a barrier to entry but um as i don't use them i'm not really the person to ask <laughs> <laughs> i think it's, it depends how you handle them mm. like i say i think you know if it's like a, an example army list for somebody and it's a smallish one if it's you know new players this is how you build it for more experienced people like us yeah maybe not i don't know if you know the period then you probably don't need to to have an army list because you probably got a good idea of of how the armies were or what you've got an idea of doing and 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 i like you ken i'm i'm more of a historical order of battle person than a a list and an army thing so i would i've already got an idea of what i want to put together I think it depends what kind of club that you you walk into, because some yeah. clubs will be purely historical. Some will be um, the sort that will like, enjoy that competitive almost game of bolt action where it's a thousand. I'm going down with a thousand points. Anybody else got a thousand points so we can play together? Mm. But I think if you've if you've turned up with the wrong thousand points. As in, you know, you've got some overpowered, superpowered, win at all cost list, and you're playing somebody who's got a relatively historical, fluffy list, then that's going to be the wrong list, isn't it? And you're probably not mm. going to have a fun game. But for anybody who's got any nous about them or any experience in the hobby, to, to create a, a relatively simple historical order of battle for late war Germans or a Napoleonic brigade. Um, or some ancient figures, then it's a rel- for me it's a relatively easy way in. If if you want to collect uh, French Napoleonics, then to build a brigade of let's say three battalions, four battalions, get a battery of artillery and a couple of units of cavalry, then that's a nice start, isn't it? That's a nice starting point. Mm-hmm. That you can go to the club with, and you know, hopefully, have a decent game that doesn't need an army list. And as you say, Ken, if that doesn't fit into the army list, then the army list's wrong, because that's a relatively historical formation. Um, so yeah, um, I think they can be uh, a barrier, but uh, it depends on what kind of club that you're walking into. Yeah, mm-hmm. and as I'm a man who builds army without knowing what rule set he's going to use, never mind army lists. Yeah, I'm definitely the wrong person to ask. Uh, Tactical Painter um, on Twitter. Everyone I know plays the Second World War in 28 mil. Not on this podcast, they don't. Uh, But I play in 20 mil. Am I still living in the 70s? And um, the Tactical Painter sent a picture of us of himself dressed in a Bay City Rollers outfit um, on a space hopper, chewing some spangles. <laughs> Um, so yes, you are still living in the seventies. <laughs> uh, no, I, th- I, I think, uh, although it's not as fashionable as it was, uh, twenty mil is still quite a big period for Second World War. I would suggest. Yeah, I think it still is. It's uh, for a lot of people. It's a go-to uh, because you can just buy loads of plastic figures, can't you? In twenty mil, you can buy ton. You can just buy you know airfix kits mm. in in twenty mil. They're probably a lot cheaper than uh, buying the. Uh, the war gaming produced twenty millimeter uh, figures and things. So yeah, I mean it's you know it's it's what I grew up on. I used to play twenty mil Second World War because it was cheap. Yeah, and I'm cheap. Nice I, easy I, one. I, could, I, like that one. I could never get my head round though um, the whole one seventy second, one seventy sixth issue. 
Oh, um, people will die on that hill. Forget about it. It's yeah. 20 mil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, that's uh, a whole new podcast with zero views. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> zero it's views. It's just 20 mil. <laughs> oh. It just used to confuse the hell out of me, to be honest. Yeah, I, I bet yeah. if you type it into uh, YouTube, somebody will have done a video. And oh, please, of please will. don't tick it from zero to one and watch it. Whatever you do, whatever you do. Uh, we've got a, a, a few questions from uh, UK uh, role player games on uh, Twitter. And Tom, the, Tom the, first one, the first one is going to cause a fight. But, uh, it's... I knew as soon as you wanted to get some questions. Tom, Tom would have just lit up, and he's he's all over it. Any anything can ask a question about. He loves it. So thanks for these, Tom. Yeah, no, yeah, cheers, Tom. <laughs> uh, even though you know this is going to cause a fight in the car park next time we meet. But there we go. Uh, so you are all vocal fans of three different scales: twenty-eight, fifteen, six mil, respectively. What are who's who though? Ooh. Uh, what are what are three short reasons why your scale is, is the best? And then give one reason for each of the other two as to why perhaps they might be better. Jesus. Wow. Well, obviously 28 mil is king. <laughs> it's easier. I think, it, I think, and this is my personal opinion, I think it's easier to paint. And I think um, when done well, it, it, it looks the best. Okay, fifteen mil here. Matisse. We're going. We're, gritty go- we're, we're going down in size, aren't we? Down. Fifteen mil here, obviously. Uh, his room. <laughs> <laughs> One, it's cheap. Uh, two, they're easy to paint, and three, uh, they suit most ground scales for most games. Ooh, ooh, nice last one. Nice last one. Sean, Sean, Sean's got. A pointy stick in his hand, I think. It's, it's a couple of brushes, but I'm thinking about stabbing myself in the eyes. <laughs> it's not them. It's not. It's not. It's not them rat hair ones, is it? You'll miss. No. You'll miss. You can't paint an eye with them. I love them brushes. Royal Lang Nickel. <laughs> he's just been. He's been painting the house with them. <laughs> and now he's still yes. painting his six mil. <laughs> Some poor child in Thailand putting them together for you. <laughs> yeah, they're relatively though getting paid a good wage, aren't they? Um, so, three, three things. Uh, cheap, easy to paint, you don't need... <laughs> We're all a, saying the same thing. You don't need a 30 foot by 6 foot table to play the Battle of Gettysburg. <laughs> You know, you say yeah, that. Um, you say that. It doesn't we, stop a lot we, of people. When we though, did Gettysburg in six mil, uh, we were twenty-two by ten. You were doing it wrong. In six mil, <laughs> you can do Gettysburg on a six by four in six mil. Not the way we do it, <laughs> and it'll look good. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've already said. I've said this a couple of times. I'm just absolutely useless at smaller scales because <laughs> all I do is use exactly the same footprint as I would with 28 mil and use more figures. <laughs> I just you know, and I, I will be the first to admit that that looks good when that's done. And Peter Berry's done yeah, yeah. some display pieces with. Uh, I think he's got a big American. Um, English of War Regiment in his display case, which is essentially on a 28 mil footprint, if you like, uh, just with lots of you know hundreds of six mil figures, and it looks fantastic. But mm. I think for the cash strapped gamer, uh, you could all you could go six mil uh, and use the same number of figures that you do for um, 28 mil, but just in a smaller area. Uh, because I, I think there, it's true that not everybody has access. Has got the same resources as people. Some people who've got the big tables, um, mm-hmm. and you shouldn't have that as a barrier to be able to play some of the big games. So if if you're if you want to play Waterloo, Alex has shown on his channel that you can play Waterloo on a six by four table, uh, and it, it looked really good. Um, I know you've got thousands of figures on that table, <laughs> Alex, uh, and it, it looked magnificent. And I will be the first to admit that a 30-foot table 
filled with, for me, my dream would be a 30 foot table filled with uh, thousands of Dixon American Civil War figures. That mm. would be my absolute dream. If I won the Euro millions uh, tomorrow, <laughs> uh, I would have every commission painter in the country <laughs> painting me <laughs> figures as fast as they could because Trevor Dixon's getting on a bit. I don't know how much longer <laughs> Dixon's miniatures are going to be around. Uh, so I'll be in like Flynn and buying the Order of Battle for Gettysburg in 120. Awesome. Um, Absolutely cool. awesome. It was interesting there that all three of us said well, yeah. that they were easy to paint. Yeah. Yeah. And I think maybe that's a lot of down to the devil you know. Yeah. I, I think, think it so. is the devil you know. Um However, and I will play devil's advocate here, that I've been painting quite a lot of 28 mil for a guy at my club um, who, who's never painted. So if if somebody didn't paint for him, he wouldn't have any painted figures. And I've really enjoyed that. Uh, I found it really mm. therapeutic. In actual fact, and I've said this a few times, my podcast is called God's Own Scale. God's Own Scale is whatever you choose it to be. It, it's always been tongue in cheek that it's been yeah. a six mil podcast, but... God's own scales, whatever you want it to be. And although uh, I suspect Thomas wanted to throw the cat amongst the pigeons there and get us arguing about it, yes, uh, I, much, I, yeah, I love yeah. all I love all <laughs> scales. I do, and you know, I admire your your work, Ken, just as much as I admire Alex's work. Um, and any any nicely painted figure, whatever scale, whatever period, I, I can admire it. Yeah, I agree with you. And just it's to remind a, yeah. the listeners that, as we said on the previous brews in the Binyard, God's own scale is anything you want it to be. God's own county is Yorkshire. <laughs> I, I set it up uh, for 100%, you. 100%. You knock it out of the park. <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is one of the catchphrases <laughs> of brews in the Binyard, that. Yeah, that is God's own county. And I'm outnumbered, so I yeah. can't do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so one reason why each of the other two um, might be better. Well, six mil. I'm gonna, you know, I I'll go with what Sean says. I have nothing against six mil at all, but unless it's that same big footprint with big units, it doesn't scratch my visual itch, if you like. Um, and, and that's just my personal preference. So I think six mil. Um, in fact, you know, six mil, ten mil. Um, looks fantastic in big unit sizes. I think it looks really, really good. Um, and, you know, when you're doing those sorts of sizes, unless you're fortunate, and I always say, uh, I'm, 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 a, I'm a lucky boy in that I've worked hard all my life. Is it Thomas Jefferson, wasn't it? He said, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Um, <laughs> and Gary Player said that as well. Did he say it? Well, I think, want Thomas Jefferson first. Well, yeah, I imagine so. I know Gary Play is old, <laughs> but he's in his eighties. But <laughs> yeah. I can't remember. I can't remember Thomas Thomas Jefferson winning any golf masters. But then I can't. Remember, <laughs> I can't. I can't remember Gary Player being a, a signature to the American Constitution either. No, no, I don't think he's quite that old. Could be one of the uh, So yeah, uh, so that's me. Fifth, one one uh, of the ironies on that, Ken. One of the ironies on that about. Um, how six mil at the, in the modern world is presented, you know, in the, in the current zeitgeist of six mil gaming, um, with the the uh, unit basing. And yeah, I don't like the that fact at all. That the the polymos the polymos rules that uh, back a cell plus the ultra freedom plus your likes of Bluka or volume baning where it's a unit basing. Um, the the standard sort of size in the industry if you like it's a 60 mil by 30 mil base with 24 figures on um that's how my american civil war is based however it possibly doesn't play into the strength of the scale quite as well as what you're advocating which is a 20 you know the the footprint of a 20 28 mil unit where you might have 36 figures but 306 mil figures on there and let's have a look what that looks like. And that, you know, that would, mm. that really plays into the strength, I think, far more of the scale of six mil. Um, but, it, you know, it's horses for courses. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you, you know, it depends on the size of your pocket, uh, the space that you've got, et cetera, et cetera. 
Yeah. And 15 mil, I've got 7,000 15 mil Napoleonics behind me. So yeah. I can't <laughs> really... I love 15 mil. Yeah. I love 15. It, it, it was the scale uh, of um, my sort of late teens, early 20s before I went, I had enough money to buy 28 mil. And then, of course, now you've got plastic 28 mil, which makes them a lot more affordable. I mean, I don't know what, mm. how, it, how they would compare plastic 28 mil versus metal 15. Are they about the same about price? About the same. About, about the, the same, same price. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Peter yeah. Bigger just over 50 pence a figure now. Uh, so and I think some of the figures you've been buying, Alex, are more than that, aren't they? The AB figures. Uh, yeah, AB is probably about 70p a figure, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, I don't really, class, I don't really pay, pay much attention to it. I just, I want to, I'll buy them. So one one reason then from I, I've done mine. One reason from the other two as why their compatriots other scales would be, might be better. Um. Okay, I'll do next because I'm we're going down in scale again, aren't we? So, uh, I'd say twenty eight uh, is probably better for, whew, well, for detail, I think, and for just for enjoying to paint the figure. Mm. There's a lot of stuff you can you can ignore on 15 mil figures. Whereas if you just want to get into actually painting something and making it look nice, I think 28 mil is much better in that in that respect. Uh, and again, like you know, I've got 28 mil stuff anyway, and I do like it, and I like seeing 28 mil games at shows and things. And I like playing 28 mil when I get the chance to do it. So I've got nothing against it, but I think yeah, I enjoy painting 28 mil. Uh, because I know I can do a little bit more detail on them than you can do with a 15 mil. With a 15 mil, I kind of treat them a little bit like a uh, like a like a factory outlet. You know, you're just churning them out, kind of thing. Whereas 28 mil, I'm I'm concentrating more on what's actually happening on the figure. And then with six mil, um, doing that big battle thing, which is what I do with six mil. You know, um, having thousands of figures on the table. Uh, I skirmish in 15 mil. I do big battles in 6 mil. And that's, you know, the Waterloo game you mentioned there, Sean, 6,000 figures on the table. I can't do that in 15 mil because mm. I haven't got 6,000 15 mil uh, <laughs> uh, Napoleonics oh, yet. But <laughs> there's time, there's time. <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, uh, so yeah, so for that big big battle, I think uh, uh, 6 mil does it better than 15 mil. Excellent. So they're my two things, I think. Sean, did you? I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd, probably exactly the same, really. Um, I've I've never hidden the fact that it's a it's a show. If there's a very good big twenty eight mil game on, normally something like what the Perry's put on, for instance, at Partizan, mm. um, or there was a, a club from Birmingham that used to put on large Napoleonic games playing in the Grand Manor. Sods. Can't quite remember. Sods, Shelley, um, Oak and District War Games Society. There you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they they were spectacular, and you can't beat that spectacle. I love. I no, do love. You can't. Huge. <laughs> I do love <laughs> <laughs> huge six mil games. The likes of <laughs> Pear Broden has put on that. Uh, Robert yeah. Dunlop has put on at the Joe Six over the years. They are great, but uh, you know, for me, the the spectacle of large units of 28 mil figures on a huge table takes some beating. Oh, I um, agree, yeah, 100% agree. For, just for that spectacle, the visual aspect. Yeah. Of it. Uh, and 15 mil, I'm a died in the wool 15 mil fan. I've got thousands of 15 mil <laughs> figures. So, uh, you know, for, and particularly for the games that, you know, what's been the vast majority of my gaming over the last few years with the Peter Pig games and these are the games that I quite like where it's two, two and a half hours in an evening uh, on a sm- in a small space playing against a friend in a period where you get a plausible outcome, the figures look nice the scenery looks nice well that's what the hobby's all about so. exactly that Excellent. Exactly that. nice quick one coming up now um, still on UK role player games uh, will you be going to Steel Lard this year and if you were putting a game on <laughs> what would it be and why yes yes and Algernon pulls it off uh, and I am doing yes and if the, <laughs> if the Lord spares us uh, I'll be doing another Mesopotamia game with thousands of figures so you're both going to steal Lord yeah when is it do we know 
November can't time? Remember. Yeah, I think it's around November time, I think. Can't remember off the top of my head. Well, I shall endeavour to get to Steel Lord. I've Do. never been. Yeah, it'd be great to see you. Yeah, it yeah good, it's it great. Good for, good for so long it's year. not the last weekend or the third weekend. I'm away for that. But if it's a weekend in November I can get to, I'll get to it. And uh, I know you, we'll uh, Tom has mentioned about it before. Uh, I would love to get it. I've never been to a Lardy Games Day, and I keep saying I'm going to try and get to it. because It was fun. It's a good I, way to I, try it I, I enjoyed it. And um, as doing something quite different to what everyone else was doing I didn't feel Mm -hmm. out of place at all apart from the Bradford City shirt obviously (laughs) yeah you got your head kicked in for that didn't you (laughs) yeah yeah, it's in in Sheffield so we've all got our cross to bear yeah exactly we're coming down we're we're coming down we're we're getting through them we're getting through them Uh, so (laughs) only another three hours to go no we were well uh, there's a couple of really quick ones and then there's uh, a massive fighty one a little bit later on. I think I know which one that is, but we'll see. Uh, so, um, planning on writing a Sodor Civil War. Isn't that fucking Thomas the Tank Engine? It is yeah, Thomas yeah. the Tank Engine, yes. I've, I've seen this. Is, it, yeah. is this a real thing? Yeah, yeah. It, it really exists. Yeah, this is, the this island is of Sodor. more stupid than Emu Wars. This is, this is proper weird shit. Is this like... Yeah. Ser- Serious. Tom, this is... Thomas the Tank Engine with AK forty sevens. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, they'd be armored trains, better. wouldn't they? Uh, he's probably going to draw like... on Russian, Spanish, and very British Civil War for inspiration. So, can the panel give me ideas about possible areas of friction I can throw at my future players, other than armored trains with faces? It's got to involve there the fat controller, trains. isn't it? Yeah. Have you seen yeah, my picture got... of Thomas the Tank Destroyer? <laughs> have you not? Oh, no. No. I'll have a look back on my Twitter feed. It's it's oh, awesome. I'll have a look at it's that. awesome. Thomas the Tank Destroyer. Um, what about uh, one of one of the uh, one of the armies has got a, a railway gun? There you go. That can have a big face on it as well, can't it? Yeah. Gun. Gun, no, to, gun the to the tank gun, the, the <laughs> yes, train gun, yeah. or, or Dora. Do, wasn't there one called Dora in the Second World War? Yeah. A big rail gun. So there you go, Dora, Dora the railgun, just with the other just any, trying to capture it or something. Just for any people living in Stoke, the word gunt has got a very specific meaning. <laughs> um, it has up here as well, don't worry. All right, oh. good. I know what it means. That hasn't quite reached Pudsey. Are we talking about Growler? <laughs> Yeah, I'm yeah. Saying, saying you're in the ball in that ballpark. Well, you yeah, see, you're in the same ballpark. You see, where I come from, a growler is a pork pie. <laughs> I'm not talking about not a pork pie. No. Yeah, exactly. Because there was that thing recently with that MP, wasn't there, in the ginger growler affair? Mm-hmm. And and I just thought, an orange an orange pork pie. Why would you have an orange pork pie? Has it got like apricots in it or something? <laughs> oh God. Anyway, let's just go back to the question. <laughs> okay, sorry, it's hot. I don't, I, I, you know, I, We've I'm... Doing, been doing this for three days. <laughs> well, I think the I think the friction the friction in this would be me saying, "What the fuck you know, is Thomas the Tank Engine Civil War?" I think that's what the, the friction would be. Um. Event cards. I blame Henry Hyde. Yeah. <laughs> yes, me too. Imaginations yeah. as well. Imaginations, to, yeah. To, to, so, to, to live yeah. up to. When you when you when you've bought your serial killer top trumps from the previous episode, <laughs> get a get a get a copy of Thomas Tank Engine top trumps and you can use them as activation cards. <laughs> oh, now there's an idea. You can have that for Perfect. free. You can have that for free. Yeah, market that one. <laughs> right. Another quick one. And last one of uh, UK role playing. Uh, I strongly dislike painting and modelling. Uh, you're probably in the wrong hobby. He's in the wrong hobby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I am keen to play Charlie Don't Surf. And he's been using little counters with uh, symbols. Um, but what other gubbins um, could he use instead of tokens for his forces? Well, I think I think that this is the perfect one for not having any figures. Because you can... Use Alex's fish tank for the VC, can't you? 
because you never <laughs> can see you never see them, do you? Well, just have palm trees moving about. Yeah, just have palm tree, a little, like a little <laughs> hole, little hole with a, with a, like a barrel sticking out. <laughs> there was a scenario in a long defunct War Games magazine. I think it was called Battlefield something like that it lasted about six issues oh that, i've got them behind me they were awesome those battles. yeah they're were, yeah. they were good weren't they good production values yeah um but there's a scenario for a vietnam game in there where uh you've got a, a road running down the length of the table jungle either side a few villages and the u.s uh there's a u.s convoy that got to travel down this road um and uh, the vc were all hidden but it was an umpire driven game and the idea being that the US would be fairly spooked as they go along this road, expecting to get ambushed, etc. Uh, and the, the twist in it was that there was no VC at all. And that, <laughs> <laughs> so it was just an exercise in futility for the Americans, just oh, cautiously brilliant. going about two inches down the table each time, thinking I'm going to go over a booby trap or I need to search this village. But there's nothing brilliant. there. I Brilliant. thought, what a Love shit it. game that would be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, you know, no, that would be great, when, that. When that would be great. When we were disinterested war gamers earlier on, you get, yeah. you get some yeah. feedback. Oh, yeah, yes, exactly. you would. My, you one game, my, one, my one night out uh, of the week at the club, yeah. um, you give me this shit. <laughs> yeah, but you'd be talking about it for weeks afterwards, though, wouldn't you? That's the thing. You'd still be well, the bloke about who now, put the yeah. the bloke who put the game on would be struggling to talk with no teeth in his head. Yeah. <laughs> Some young lad, he's 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 been looking at this hobby on his own on the internet, and he's got the courage <laughs> to come into his local war games club. All right, so you're playing VC tonight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, that, that beats your that beats you your moving the ammunition cart round story. <laughs> just a bit, mate. Yeah, just a bit. Uh, so, uh, UK uh, role playing gamers, uh, I do apologise. We've destroyed a number of your questions there. Yeah, no idea. Uh, yeah, you you were daft enough to put them in. So. Gave them the contempt they deserve. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Uh, there's only Sorry, four, Tom. There's, there's four, four questions left. Four questions left. Uh, Ian Fuller on Twitter. Uh, I think we'll all agree with this, actually. Strict turn sequences. Is it time to start binning them off in rules? Is it about time games were allowed to flow more realistically? Yes. Yes. I think, Alex, everything you do is... Um... There's a couple of games. Uh, square bashing, Blucher, which are strict turn sequences, but even then you could get rid of them quite easily, Yeah. to be perfectly honest. Uh Square bashing probably not so much. It's more that's a bit more turn driven. Uh, Bluker you could quite easily get rid of the turn sequence. You either fire or you move. Mm. Uh, but yeah, just get rid of it. Stupid, mm. dumb, dumb. Sean, here we go. <laughs> no, you've got to keep them. <laughs> you need a contrarian on the podcast. Don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sean, the awkward one. <laughs> <laughs> God, why am I the awkward one? It's Alex that wants to change the world. <laughs> we've had turn- I'm an idealist. I'm an idealist, Sean. We've had, we've had turn sequences since Dom Featherstone was around. Jesus. Yeah, we should get rid of them. They've been around for too <laughs> yeah, long. Nah, I need structure in my game. I need structure. How can why you play not? a what? ten-turn game if you if you don't have a turn se- sequence? No, you, no. It means like you don't you don't go right. Okay, you move. And then you fire, and then you melee. It means yeah. you can fire, and then you can move, and then yeah. you can melee, or you can melee, and then you can fire, and then you move. Um, you doing can't it, have in, your cake in... and eat it, Alex. <laughs> you can, you can. Uh, yeah, it's just it's to me, it's just completely unrealistic, totally unrealistic. I mean, all right, we're pushing toy soldiers around, but we are striving for an in inverted commas realism, and you know, real armies don't all move. 100 yards and then fire all at the same time, do they? You know, it's happening all, it's chaos. A battle is chaos. And I mean, you're talking about friction, of... aren't you? Because friction is yeah, the big thing yeah, in, yeah. in Lardy games. But mm. uh, there are, and I, I appreciate this is um, to different tastes, but there are different ways in which you can have friction, aren't there? So for, you played oh, yeah, PBI, yeah. didn't you, the other day? Mm-hmm. Um, which I was surprised was a game that you, 
it seems like you enjoyed. I was surprised about it. Yeah, that, yeah, but, yeah, I did. I did. Um, I didn't enjoy reading it. No, <laughs> uh, but for, you know, your friction there is about how many action points you get and how can you mm-hmm. best spend those action points. Um, yeah, yeah. Within that turn sequence, and there is always an opportunity for the other player to interrupt mm-hmm. with opportunity fire, return fire. Yeah, yeah. Here they come, fire that sort of thing. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I agree that there's 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 creative space around how to play out an individual turn. It, sh- it shouldn't mm-hmm. just be, I've moved, now I've shot, now I'm going to fight and take my mm-hmm. morale test. That is very Featherstonian, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, and games have moved on a lot since then. I was Although, say, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, sorry, just to finish, I, I would say the higher up the level of the game, so if you're playing a, a core level game, that I, f- I don't know, I feel like there should there needs to be a bit more structure around that because otherwise it would be complete chaos. Yeah, I think I was I just going to say divisions yes. and cores. But yes, but no, but because like yes, but, for yes, again, no, but. same again. <laughs> yes, but no, but um, like with I was going to say yes, you know, the further up the level you go, the more structured you have to be. But then even thinking about it, you probably don't because like in Blue Key, you you give a momentum points. So you can then spend those on the activations of the units within that core, and yeah, yeah, what does it matter? They're all they're acting together. So what does it matter if one fires before somebody else? Mo- another another part of it moves. It doesn't matter, you know, because it's still part of that same turn, isn't it? Yes. So yeah, if I you're agree, using yeah. if you're using action points, let's say, you know, or momentum points or whatever, then it should by it should just be more free, just mm. completely. Um, the that whole move fire melee is when you don't have action points because you know that was the way that people played games like rapid fire is like that you move, everything moves then everything fires but there's no there's no limit on what you can't do in rapid fire for example these are you know rules that i know uh, so you can move everything and then you can fire everything and then you could melee whatever's in in melee um but if you introduce action points to it, then they can do them out of sequence, mm. and it makes for a much better game because we change rapid fire to to do that. I think coming from from sense? a big game point of view, um, it's it, the the more flexible a game is, the harder it is to control with a large yes. number of players. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for for the games that we play. Um, because a card activation system is fantastic for a smaller game, um, but once you get to a certain size, it becomes quite restrictive because one person is playing that card, and ten other people, ten people are, people aren't doing, are not doing a thing. Yeah. I mean, the, the way that we've done it over the years is a bit like play your cards right. So you, <laughs> you put ten cards up, and that's the order, and you you know. More normally, each player will have a card somewhere along that row, and then so long as you're not after the guy in front of you, you can then move that, and it doesn't affect the game sequence. That's the way that we yeah. that we've tried it, and and it's been relatively successful. But mm. there does need to be with those big multiplayer games some form of a structure just to make the game playable. It's quite, yeah. It's quite because a lot think, of those systems, like you, that you're talking about, like see, they kind of break down when you get to a certain size of game. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I'd agree with that. I think, yeah, I think that's more about players though than than the size of the game. If there's only two of you, only one of you is ever going to be active. Yeah. If you even if you're on cards, aren't you? Like you could play. I don't know. Let's say I be shot mum with thousands of platoons, mm. but if there's only two two players. Only one of you is going to be operating a platoon on their draw. But the other one goes on holiday players, for a fortnight. And comes back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but if you've got ten, if you've got ten players, then there's going to be one active person and nine inactive people. Yeah. And yeah, you've got then, you know, I, that that's when, like you say, the, the, that sequence comes in. But even then, I think, even then, you could you could you could split it between the two sides and say, well, you've got five people on either side. It's one side's turn. They can the the figures in that turn, although the units in that turn can fire and move in whatever sequence they want. Mm. 
but obviously they can't activate twice or you know whatever they they can only activate once but they can either move or they can fire and it doesn't matter if you fire before you move or you fire after you move or you know if you're able to and depending on on your rules yeah, most most games uh, these days have some form of friction in now don't they this you know, I, I was I've, I got uh, beneath the lily ball beneath the lily banners. It's easy um, for you to say. Mm, uh, <laughs> teeth back. Um, you need some handles. Downloaded on that, that uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, there's even orders and stuff in that, there's orders and stuff in that that give a little bit of friction to the game, even though it's quite a traditional set of rules. Um, yeah. General, general de brigade, general army. You've got your yeah, your order yeah, yeah. system and your aid de camps and all that sort of stuff. So there's, I, I think there's very few games now that have strict, strict turn sequences. I think um, it, it's fading away. There's what a bit like me. Warhammer forty k isn't that a strict turn sequence? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. When, when, what, what have you bought, Sean? You never told us what you'd actually bought. <laughs> uh, just, yeah, uh, you're, just you're the. the... You're the 40k man here. Man. The old, the That's old your... starter set uh, called Indomitus. So uh, it's got a couple of balanced sides in it and, and the rules. So I don't think it's going to go any further than that, to be honest. But uh, I just, I just, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, we'll see. We'll is it see. someone who can fight my Tetley bit of Space Marines? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got some space robots who can fight them. I, I'll fight. I'll fight them for you. I've got a hammer. I'll bring that along. <laughs> That'll, that'll fight him. Not the you. price of the Games Workshop <laughs> models, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> Ten quid and twenty quid a figure. My, I've, I've got one. I've got a hammer. It's it's my trademark Team Yankee tank separation device. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when you see him bu- bunching up too much. <laughs> bang, bang. If you can't get a ha- if you can't get a hammer between the two tanks, they're too close. Yeah, <laughs> and you've lost a tank or two if the lot goes. <laughs> so there we go. So there's a number of dents in the table. Uh, so there we go, Ian. Um, <laughs> thank you. You'll you'll be um, glad to be organising salute again after listening to that answer. I'm sure. It was, uh, I, was t- I was talking to Ian about it actually. This exact question mm. uh, when I saw him at uh, Joya Six, we were in the pub and he was talking about it there, and he said that um, he'd um, he'd he'd written some Napoleonic rules with. That exactly in mind, mm. uh, so you know, he's he was he was he's trying to upset the apple cart, definitely there, yeah. And good luck to him, I say, yeah. And, and there'll be because when um, that soldiers of Napoleon came out from Warren Kincaid, loads of people were, Oh, do we need another set of Napoleonic rules? That was a, a big talking point. Mm. If they sell, who cares? <laughs> so, uh, ooh, ooh, yeah, I think we might have a different point of view on this one. Uh, Krusty G, no, Chris G, Krusty Colonel. Sorry, apologies, Chris, Krusty. I got your middle name in the wrong place there. Uh, shouldn't it be? Shouldn't it be rank first? English standards. Come on. Uh, Twitter, is there a danger of fabulously painted figures and terrain, either through magazine articles or at shows, putting off aspiring war gamers? Why not more coverage of It's Good Enough at Three Feet? Do you want me to... That is a, that is a good me, question. Do you want me to... Yes. Yeah, go on. You lead the charge on that one. I right, think well, I know where you're going with this one, Ken. Uh, what, um, what I'd like to say to all my... Uh, Listeners, is it's been lovely having you aboard this show for <laughs> twenty eight episodes, maybe twenty nine <laughs> if I split this into two. Uh, um, I, I, I'm relatively controversially. I'm going to say no, um, with some caveats because, and I think you discussed this on your your show a bit with with Pete Berry, John, um, about partisan and and how it being kind of the pinnacle. In, in in inverted commas, in some ways of of, of the hobby, um, and I think for, for for partisan, I'm paying my money to go into a show, and I want to see the best, um, you know. And I'd pay fifty quid to go and see Iron Maiden, one of the one of my favourite bands, um, and I expect the best light show, the best. Um, stage set up, the best sound, the whole nine yards. Um, but if I paid a fiver, I'd be quite happy with some bloke sitting on a tea chest playing a guitar made out of a tobacco <laughs> box. 
So, <laughs> um, I, I think this. I think there's there, there's room for more. There's room for both. But I think it shows that are, are there to show off the hobby. Then I don't think it should put off. And, and we've talked about this before, Sean, me and you, about um, the difference between aspiration and being put off by something. And I think it's a personality thing because I, you know, I talk many times about that seeing that twenty-eight mil game and not being frightened of it and going, I want to do that. I, I want to aspire to do that. And I think when people, when I see stuff painted better than mine, uh, very rarely happens, obviously. <laughs> I imagine. Um, yeah, um, but you know, I, I, I think, ooh, how, how have they done that? Um, that's interesting. I want to know, is that going to help me? Am I going to develop my technique by looking at that? Um, so it's not putting me off seeing something better than I can do. Because there's whatever you do in life, there's always somebody better than you. Mm -hmm. One of the most important lessons you can learn in life. So I'm not frightened of it. I want to aspire to it. And that's where I come from. I think I've been on both sides of this, Ken, in the past. And I think one I've talked about probably most often is a game put on at Warfare and Reading, where it was the first game you saw as you walked through the door. And it was the most amazing Blenheim game I've probably ever seen. 20-odd foot long, um, 28 mil front rank figures, in the main, painted beautifully from one end of the table to the other, just two long lines of figures, absolutely gorgeous. Um, and I've said in the past that for me, that is an off putting sight for a newcomer to the hobby. So if, if somebody wanders in off the street, curious as to what wargaming is, and sees that, and the guy who was running it, I've got a feeling it was Matt Slade. Can't, I can't say that for sure, but I had a conversation with him, or overheard him having a conversation, and said there's something like twenty thousand pounds worth of figures on this table. I assume that meant that with the painting as well. Um, and for somebody walking in thinking, oh, this might be the hobby for me, and and having a look at that and saying, oh, that's quite good, but it's going to cost me twenty grand. This is an extreme. I appreciate. Um, for a long time, I've said that for me that would be off-putting. However, um, and I don't, I'm not going to blow smoke where the sun doesn't shine here, Ken. <laughs> but I think my attitude has changed a little bit over, well, since I've known you, to be honest, and since I've listened to your podcast, in that these things can be aspirational. Um. And how do you eat an elephant? You take it one bite at a time. You wouldn't go out and buy 10 grand's worth of front rank figures, would you, straight off, having never wargamed before, thinking I'm going to play Blenheim next week, and then you think, oh, actually, <laughs> it's going to take me five years paint all these figures. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with, uh, and there are people in the hobby that will buy a huge collection of figures and, and take three years to paint it. Ollie Canalad, is it? The guy? James, James. James, uh, yeah, James Loach is. Uh, uh, I know James. Yes, yeah, so I followed his blog for a long time. Yeah, he does wonderful figures and fantastic collections. But he, he'll start off, and uh, I remember his Peninsula collection uh, on his blog. He sent in a huge order to front rank, kilos worth of uh, figures <laughs> from front rank, and then put them all on the table. This huge mountain of front rank figures. And then just slowly painted his way through them. Uh, He's the auction his lad. He was after the, he were after the discount. <laughs> ah, right, there you go. Uh, Did he get free so, shipping on it, did he? I, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, my attitude's changed a little bit. I've shifted in my feelings on this. Uh, I like, if I go to Partisan, I want to see those beautiful big games, particularly the Perry games, because uh, just something about how they present their big 28 mil games just really attracts me. Uh, the fact they actually play them at the show as well helps. 
they play their games through. So the Blenheim game was really a static display. And I can understand that, you know, it's if there's only two or three of you there, you, you can't play a massive game like that through and still talk to the public and engage the public. I understand that. Um, but, yeah, I, I've, I've shifted. So, uh, no, I don't think it's off-putting. I think it is aspirational. Um, and people should take inspiration from uh, the best that there is out there. Yeah, you said we're disagreeing. I don't think we will because ah, I'm. I thought I, thought I'm I was the in same trouble. Here. <laughs> no, 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 far from it. I, this is I the, agree. This is it's the question that gets me in trouble on Tinder Webnet all the time. <laughs> I, I think it's everyone gets everyone gets what I'm saying wrong. Yeah. They think I'm. They think <laughs> I'm saying that big games in 28 mil are by far the best and better than absolutely anything else, and. That's how my mind works, but I'm not saying that. What I'm saying, I'm not saying what you're doing is shit. What I'm mm -hmm. saying is what I'm doing is really good fun, and it looks ace. Why don't you try it? Mm -hmm. That's what I've always said. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a. I think there's a, a massive place for the three foot rule, and I, I live my life by it. Mm. You know, I, all my Me figures too. are painted to a three foot rule. Me too. Uh, but then I don't want to go to parties and. And see people who are painting shite like I'm painting. <laughs> you know, I want to see, I want to see well painted figures. You know, because I, I can see there, Alex. But I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, but I can see shite at home. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> if I want to see people playing playing uh, games on on uh, bottle green boards, then that's what some people do now at the club. So, you know. Uh, and to me, wargaming is all about immersion. It's about that's why I try to. I've upped my terrain game because I want to be immersed in the games that I'm playing. Uh, and I take that inspiration and that aspiration from those games that I see at places like Partizan in particular, you know, and at Joya Six, you know, the other week and, and any other any other show, really. Um, uh, I don't want to go to a show and, and, and see something that I could see at the club where a couple of people just tipped up with, you know, 500-point bolt-action armies and throwing whatever terrain on the table that they've got. I want to see something that makes me think, yeah, this is, you know, this is the hobby I want to be part of. And I can understand how it would be off putting. I can understand why some people would think it would be off putting. Uh like you said, Sean, about, you know, how would you ever achieve that kind of thing? But then you know, you the you've already said it, how do you eat an elephant? One but one piece at a time. It's uh you know, you're not, you're not, you're not a snake. You're not going to unhook your your jaw and swallow <laughs> it all at once, are you? Unless you're a lunatic. But well, look, um, look at look at that um, forty mil Peninsula War game that was the Ian Smith tribute at Partizan. Yeah. Mm. I mean, that was just absolutely. St you could stand yeah. at that table probably all day and just walk around it and see yeah. something different everywhere. Mm -hmm. you? And that that really is the pinnacle, isn't it, of what we see. Yeah in the hobby. You don't see many better display games than that, I don't think. No, no, Anywhere. definitely not. And I, and yeah, you and you're not you you don't you even if you're not playing it, you just you you you're just letting it wash over you, aren't it? How yeah. how good it is. Exactly. To, you're to appreciating it, the artistry, yes. aren't you? And the effort that's exactly, been put into exactly. it. I think the hobby's changed um uh, over the years as well because I think now um you know, if somebody came up to me uh, and said, oh, you know, how have you painted that or wanted some tips or something like that, I'm I'm, I'm not going to turn around and go, ooh, piss off you little bastard or whatever. I'm going to I'm going to say, oh, yeah, no problems and, and help people out and, and give them tips and help them and talk about how I do projects and stuff like that. So, it, you know, it's there. And people want to ask questions, and you know. It, it, well, I think this is a big thing with the with the internet yeah. has, has changed a lot of stuff, and and uh, and in particular, I mean, you know, I'm, I, my wargaming hobby is on on YouTube, and I think YouTube is very good for that because it can help you get to a 
a good standard with painting or with terrain making or with everything you know and i and i watch videos i watch modeling videos and i watch terrain making videos all kinds of things and i draw all that influence and i'm still learning stuff you know uh, and i'm sure you two mm. still well maybe ken isn't but you know, well, sean yeah, you're you say learning, that i'm I've, sure I've, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do a video on it tomorrow but i've picked up a new line of paints this week Contrast. Speed paints. These are real artist paints for. Uh, are they in tubes? It, yeah, they're in tubes. <laughs> tubes. <laughs> tubes. <laughs> but, but I think even that, though, the, uh, just to, to finish that, my point is, is that there is still a danger there where I think other people have said it. They, they watched the painting video and it's been yeah. a case of, right, uh, Okay, this is something that everybody can do, and then they get out their airbrush and start airbrushing stuff. <laughs> yeah, and that pisses I think me is off. it you she on the central? Yeah, and it's like that. The, I don't think there's probably enough videos maybe out there that just show you do to the basics, the basics of painting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the real basics. And I try to do that with my stuff. I, you know, I paint for the tabletop uh, yeah. unless I'm painting a model or something, uh, and I try to show people on my painting videos. You can do this quickly because I can do it quickly. You can do it quickly. Yeah. It's dead easy, and they look all right from three foot away. Uh, so there's there's that, you know, the, there's those breakdowns of, of barriers to entry as well. It's not just about, you know, that that one one aspect. It's lots of different aspects, isn't it? That yeah. People can work on to break barriers down if that's what they require. And just one one thing we one thing we haven't talked about um, is is the War Games magazines and. Um, mm. I would say that a third of them, if you if you if we look at War Games Illustrated, Miniature War Games, WSS, apologies if I've forgotten any. Um, certainly, they're the three main ones in in Europe or the UK. Of those, uh, Miniature War Games consistently has average, and I'm not using that word in a bad way, painting in it. You know, mm. uh, War Games Illustrated specifically and to some extent WSS go for those you know the best painted stuff that you could possibly get but you don't yeah, yeah. have that and that's not a negative you don't have that in the other magazine um so i think you know and that's a third of the, the 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 magazines that are out there so you can you can look at games in that um, by the people who you know regularly david tucky we've had a question from earlier on um, regularly puts articles in there, and Conrad Kinch as well. And you, you know, I, I, you know, they they have standard war game painted armies, and I th- and I think that's a great thing in that in that magazine that it, you know it has all sides of it in there. Mm-hmm. So I, I think we've uh, yeah I think we've all agreed on that. I thought we'd be you know I, have, yeah. I thought we yeah bloody Yorkshire bastard. I'll see you in the car park. <laughs> bring your bring your ferrets and we'll have a scrap. That may still happen. It still might yeah. <laughs> the, the time is the, the the night is young. Is <laughs> <laughs> uh, there two, days there two more listeners. questions and one of them's really quick? So um, Andy. <laughs> F O G H Fog Foggy Fog, Fog yeah. yes. Uh Friends of General H. Yeah, that's it, yeah. I, yeah. Uh how do you make a bloody Mary? And do you know what I think this is? Because you put that Worcestershire sauce in it, don't you? Sauce in it. Well, can't mm. you put Henderson so, yeah. relish in it? I think yes, you, could. you can. I think you could. And that would make it much better. Yeah. So Nice try. I've never nice. had the stuff, and there you go. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice try, Andy, for, get, for trying to get us to say that we use Worcestershire shorts in Bloody Mary. But you're banned from listening to this podcast ever again. <laughs> yeah. You're banned from the next 10 minutes. You can listen to God's Own Scale, mate, though. That's, that's absolutely fine. Come over to God's oh, yeah, Scale. you can watch Storm of Steel as well. Please do, you know, but not this, not this podcast. Come, come, on, come, on my, come on my channel. Get rid of my listeners. <laughs> It's a dog eat dog world, mate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you out there, you 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 love Yorkshire gamers. I know you do. <laughs> uh, all those lovely emails you send me at the start, you twat. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't think you'd know they were off me, to be honest. But there you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, you sign them. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> don't put your name on the head. <laughs> don't put my name Love on Sean. it. Love Sean. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, actually, we've got another question. Uh, two, two questions left, uh, and this one um, is: uh, I had a few drinks last night, and I woke up in a strange place, and uh, I've got an itch. What do I do? Uh, and that's from Sean near Stoke. <laughs> Hendo's relish. <laughs> Hendo's relish. There you go. Secure or awesome. Right, there we go. Uh, Just rub it in. Yeah. It'll be it'll be fine. It won't sting. It's at making all. me eyes water. <laughs> oh, dear me. Uh, viewers, you'll be glad to know that this is the last question. Um, so Barnaby, Barnaby, or out there in Canada. Hello, Barnaby. Uh, what has been the biggest changes you've seen in the hobby since you started gaming and do you feel those changes have positively or negatively impacted the wider hobby 3D printing absolutely unbelievably positively uh, changing the hobby it is the future absolutely like 100% red. aye <laughs> even more so even more future it's certainly yeah, 3D printing it's certainly coming on now that Calabero miniatures, um, the first pit, first three D printed miniatures that aren't vehicles that I've looked at and gone, yeah. I'd, 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 if I was into El Cid or whatever uh, period, mm-hmm. I'd, I'd have some of those. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just don't want another. I don't want a three D printer. <laughs> you don't have to get one. Somebody else will do it for you. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's just a problem that you throw money at until it goes away. Yeah, um, and I then, got one. then you know, I'm I'm still at that stage now. <laughs> Call me a cynical old whatever. Um, but I, if I order stuff from the Perrys, I know what's coming through the door. Whereas if I if I own stuff from Dodgy Dave's white 3D <laughs> printing. In Afghanistan or wherever, I've got no idea what's going to come. You know, it could be printed. Yes, printed but there was, all, there was also plane bomb or something like that. But there was also a time when you didn't know what you were getting from the Perrys. Well, to be fair, you, you never know what they're going to come. What weird shite they're going to come <laughs> with next? <do> you? <laughs> exactly. But I mean, you know, there's people like uh, like Paul that sabotaged who does fantastic work, and his his prints are incredible. I know. Uh, the reason I'm saying it now is because you know he he's he does you some freebies. really uh, no he hasn't he's made me pay for him all the bastard <laughs> even though I'm always saying how good his stuff is uh, but his his stuff is incredible and uh, and and really well printed and he's not alone you know there's there's plenty of other people out there do it paint and glue Gary at paint and glue is another good one that produces great stuff mm. uh, and not just stuff that they sell you can send them well you could probably send them uh, STLs and they will print them out for you as well they'll do a service like that depending on the licenses and things but you know i, I think i think yeah, i think 100 uh, percent uh, 3d printing is is the it's the it's the biggest shake-up i think we've seen in this hobby in the last 30 years so the, uh, these guys that have they got like industrial standard printers rather than the ones that I, you and i would buy yes i mean they'd have bigger ones uh and and uh, ones that can uh, probably work faster than the things that we we would be able to get. You know, they probably spent like a thousand pounds on a printer, where we would spend like two hundred quid on a printer. Uh, but even so, even the even the domestic ones that we can get are still good now. But you have to learn how to use it. Yeah, obviously you have to be. You know, you it's a everybody says it, it's a hobby in itself, and and just learning how to use the thing is is you know a learning process. Uh, this is me speaking as though I've never had any experience with them whatsoever. I'm just going on what other people have said. Uh, but I am quite more than happy uh, to talk to Paul at Sabotage and say, can you do me X buildings? Yeah, He'll send me some pictures of them, uh, the 3D renders. I'll say, you know, change whatever, put this on here, move this about, he does that. And then he'll send them, print them out, uh, print them out and send them to me. And... I have not been disappointed yet. He, he's doing quite a bit, I think, for the Lardies, isn't he? For their Arnhem he is. game. That's right. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's producing all the uh, the buildings for Arnhem and stuff, and it just looks so good. All the stuff that Nick Skinner has been posting up and Nate Deacon, that's all uh, Paul's three D yeah. printed stuff. That farm that I put up 
uh, just recently. I don't know if you saw yeah. that, the 15 mil farm. That's all 3D printed from Paul. Incredible stuff, really is. And it's and the amount of detail that you can get on on things uh, is 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 uh, it's mind blowing, really. Yeah, it's it really it's is. getting to that point now where I am thinking that stuff out, but it's mm. it's taken a long while. For the 3D printing's been around for six or seven years. Oh, it's been around it? for ages. Um, yeah, I've got some old stuff from Shapeways that I got some some old um, Bristol fighters. Because uh, they were the only ones I could get in one one four scale before Wings of Glory released theirs, and um, and they shit. But you know they're like ten years old, but they they look like they look crap. But I know now if they were produced now, I know Gary at um, again at uh, Paint and Glue he did some he did me some BE two Cs, and they look fantastic compared to the the ones that were uh, I got ten years ago. I mean, uh, I, I've just... got nothing in in the pipeline at the moment. Um, project wise that is going to use 3D printed stuff because I've either got mm. the figures in house or I'm yeah, already yeah, working yeah, yeah. through a range of figures and would would keep them so I mean who knows in the future uh, I might go 3D yeah well figures. again just speaking of that I mean I I just got this week uh, Stu over at Mil- Miniature Realms he, he, he sent me a bunch of US Marine Corps mm. in 15 mil uh, spares that he'd he'd be because he's printing them off for his his project. He got a load load left over, so he sent them to me, mm. uh, and they're great, perfect. You know, I've just got a bunch of of uh, of Marines for a fiver, yeah. and I've got a, a platoon of them that I can put together for a chain of command, mm. uh, and they're lovely, really nice figures. And his 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 is a, a domestic printer. His is a you know probably as basic as it comes. Yeah, Sean, you've spoken to a lot of. Um... 3D printer people on your podcast, haven't you? Is it? But you've not dabbled yourself yet. No, I think for the same reasons that you you said, Ken. That um, I've got, I've really got the fi- figures I need, um, and I've got a manufacturer or manufacturers figures that I enjoy using. I'm not saying I'm not open minded to using. 3D printing services in the future. I can't ever see myself getting one uh, because I think it would end up a hobby within a hobby. I've got friends who've got filament printers. Uh, I don't know anybody who's got a resin one, but uh, you know the the prices are coming down all the time. Um, mm-hmm. There's more and more STL files coming out all the time. I mean, mm-hmm. in the fantasy genre, there's some incredible stuff available if you look mm-hmm. through ebay at 3d printed fantasy stuff so uh war master one of the old games workshop games 10 mil mass battle game uh out of production for years from games workshop and the actual figures that games workshop made are, are selling well it'd be cheaper to buy gold uh it's <laughs> going for incredible prices but there's now 3d print companies that are producing the same figures and they are absolutely gorgeous. I've seen some of them in the flesh, and they're just incredible. The technology that's out there, you know, I fear for traditional figure ma- manufacturers over the next 10 years or so. Um, They'll I just think change. it's going to become so ubiquitous. They'll just change. It's just it's, Yeah, they'll it's evolve. Something. They'll evolve, yeah. Well, so I think we'll probably see a change in of the guard, if you like, because you were talking earlier on, Sean, about, you know, Trevor Dixon and... Um, you know that generation that first generation of figure manufacturers are all i would guess now 70s um you know um rod langton i've not seen rod for for many years he he must be in his mid 70s must be um and you know there's there's only not, not that i'm wishing it in any way shape or form but there's only so long that they can carry on doing what they're doing and and um Oh, I can't remember the name. The, the guy who did the basses, Tony from e... ERM. ERM uh, retired, didn't he, last year with his wife being poorly. Um, so, yeah, so that generation of figure manufacturers are slowly going to um, fade away like old soldiers. Um, and they're going to be replaced by a new generation of most likely 3D printed figures. Mm. Um, and they'll still be, you know, I, I think the Perry's uh, mid fifties, maybe, maybe slightly older. So there's still, there's still some years in them lads. 
Um, <laughs> they can, you know, come up with Bolivian uh, turnip <laughs> war of twelve seventy two or whatever that is going to come next. I, I still, I think, you know, at least for probably for the next twenty years, people are still going to be buying metal and plastic figures. Yeah off people like the Perrys, like you say, at least for the next 20 years, next mm. couple of decades. But I just think it's going to get more and more ubiquitous with the 3D prints mm. as well. They're going to learn to live side by side. Because everyone, every, we, we, you know, we, we, we said with, with the hobby would die when computer wargaming got, uh, you know, total mm. war, total roam got to the, the stage that it's at now. And it hasn't because, and, no, no. you know, I've seen uh, 3D printed colour miniatures. And some people will, you know, the people who really, really don't like painting will go for them. But there's still a vast swathe of this hobby who enjoy the painting side of it and will be yeah, quite yeah, yeah. happy having unpainted miniatures. Um, Again, there's always been pre-paints around, hasn't it? I mean, like Wings of Glory, Winds of mm. War stuff. That's all pre-painted. You know, I still bought it. I love painting and I like I like plane modelling, yeah. you know, but I still bought it. Uh, so, yeah, there's always still... Still, that as well in the in the thing. So there's always going to be people who want to paint. Mm. And the X Wing as well was another one, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 And they were really good. And they were the sort of thing that I looked at and went, for the price, I can't get a unpainted model and spend all the time on it and paint it up to that standard for for that um, that value when you take into account the time it would take up. So yeah, yeah, so yeah. um, Obviously, for for the older ones amongst us, electricity uh, has been a big change in the hobby, and um, gas electricity, people, yeah, gas into people's <laughs> homes and uh, printed <laughs> printed text rather than handwritten, and um, yeah. Uh, but my, uh, the, my 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 answer was going to be social media, to be honest, um, because okay, yeah, uh, whereas. It used to be your, your only contact with the hobby was the War Games magazines once a month, which I'd read within a couple of hours. <laughs> you know, I'd devour <laughs> them as soon as I got them. Uh, sometimes before I got home from Smith's. Um, social media now, uh, with the likes of the, that corner of Twitter that we use, which in general is a positive space, isn't it? Facebook probably less so, yeah, but yeah. even so there's still some good stuff on Facebook. Uh, there's never any... You never go to a war game show now, do you? And be surprised at a new range of figures or a new rule book that's come out because you've heard about it already um, yeah, through social yeah. media. And, you know, it's the internet as well, I suppose. But I think social media in general, for me, um, us three wouldn't be talking if it wasn't for social media. We would we'd never have yeah, yeah. bumped into each other, would we? Um, no, no. Uh, so th- you know, there's so downfall. It does. It does, it does so yeah, I was going to say it does have a negative, <laughs> doesn't it? Really. Uh, so I think I think it's just it, what it, what it's done is just opened up these lines of communication for people of a like mind. Because let's face it, you put any group of war gamers in a room who've never met each other, and within seconds they're going to be chatting away about the hobby and they've got that common bond haven't they um and unless social they, media unless they is, use round dice and then they can unless you use round <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> um so i think i think for me social media the fact that we can be in touch with people worldwide not not just mm. across this country but worldwide and you know we've all made contacts with people uh all over the world through social yeah, yeah. media uh, and played would, games with them as well. Yeah, like yourself. Virtual least, games, yeah. you know. So uh, it, it's just a wonderful thing that when I first joined the hobby, you know, nobody would even dream of it, never mind wish for it. It, it was just an impossible thing. Mm. And I think the, the 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 most positive change has been the painting portal, without a shadow of a doubt. It's revolutionised painting. <laughs> It's the future. It's the future. I can't oh. wait to find a picture of that. I, I've got to post I, that up on Twitter if anybody can find it. Uh, you, can you remember how much it was, Alex? I don't think I even looked into it. I can't remember. I didn't. I didn't look that far no, into I was, it. I, I was too busy. I can, 
I can imagine now how um, people in the Yorkshire Dales feel when they see a helicopter. You know that? <laughs> that helicopter? A train? That, that sort of wide-eyed, open-mouth, complete what is disbelief. That? What, is, what is that? <laughs> it's, it's heading to like. I think you're both you... pulling my leg. I do, to be honest. I can't believe anybody has come up with that as an idea. No, I'll find, I'll find yeah, it. I'll find we'll it. Definitely I'll definitely find yeah. it, mate. Because I'll it's, send it, to it, you. it was. I, I was. I was gobsmacked. I was absolutely gobsmacked, and it, it's it, it's a rare thing that makes me have nothing <laughs> to say and just go. What is that? <laughs> I might have to buy one now and just uh, see what the fuss oh, is about. God. I can't imagine the cheap. It looked, you know, fairly... It was tech. over-engineered, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. It looked like, That's me know, out, then. I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> yeah, it kind of looked, you know, like German tanks in World War Two have got 27,000 <laughs> moving parts. <laughs> and they look the business, and they're technically rather good, but... Jesus Christ, they break down all the time. Actually, having a read, I mean, there's, there's some bloke somewhere, uh, the port, Wargaming Painting Portaloo Hotline. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Life could, is too short, isn't it? Life could, is too how short. Could serious, how could you have a serious conversation with that man or woman? <laughs> or, uh, because you're going to ring up and you're going to go, I've got a problem with my Wargaming paint Portaloo. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're just going to go how have you got in the position where you're <laughs> the helpline <laughs> person for the War Games Paint Portaloo what tragic story of <laughs> deprivation <led> this circumstance <laughs> <laughs> listen everyone's got to make a living yeah but anyway Absolutely. so on that note gentlemen um I'd like to thank you both very much <laughs> once again for taking part in Brews of the Binyard, and um, it's been a pleasure as always talking to you. Uh, we answered, Thanks we, for we having might us, have answered some questions <laughs> I think, I think we might in a fashion, some. yeah. But I think, in I think, fashion. um, over all the episodes, I think people know what they're going to get with these episodes, mm. and that's kind of why that's kind of why I do it. Yeah, it's a shame that I didn't know what I was going to get before I signed up. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You didn't read the small print, well, Alex. That was a problem. I didn't. No. I didn't. It's because I can't read, Sean. Oh, there you go. You, you see, Alex read the 15 mil print. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, Sean, Sean's got all the uh, the dirt because he's got the 6 mil print. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I can't, I can't see anything that small, you see. Unless it's in a really Your crayons big... don't draw that small, do they? Yeah, unless it's in a really big unit and then I can see it. <laughs> Uh, well um, just leaves me to say goodnight to our audience if you'd like to say goodnight gentlemen goodnight thanks for listening goodnight I hope that was of use to somebody somewhere (laughs) (laughs) no not a chance There we go. There's another bruise in the vineyard, done and dusted. Um, I always enjoy talking to Sean and Alex, and uh, I appreciate that it's not the most informative war games podcast out there. Um, but I personally enjoy making these podcasts, and I do hope that um, some of you out there in- enjoy these chat that uh, me, Alex, and Sean have. We've got different views on lots of things in the hobby and we're known for different scales within the hobby and I think it's nice to get a cross section um, of of different viewpoints uh, on, a, on a podcast um, so uh, if I can persuade them uh, the boys will be back at Christmas for a Christmas brews in the binyard and uh, I certainly look forward to that if it comes off and uh, regular viewers uh, listeners and uh, those who just prefer a normal in inverted commas podcast you'll be glad to know that uh, we are back next month uh, episode 30 back to the usual format um, in fact I've got guests booked in now 30 31 and 32 and then 33 will be a catch-up episode and um as i haven't contacted the people yet i've got a good idea who's going to be on that 
Um, so we are back to uh, normal programming. And uh, next episode, which I hope is going to be out in the middle of August, I'm going to be speaking to a chap from Australia, from Fremantle. And uh, it is Carlo Pagano. And I hope I've got that last name right, Carlo. Um, and uh, if you careful listener to these podcasts you'll have heard carlo's name mentioned a few times when uh, referring to big gaming and um, the reason carlo is coming on the show is that he has uh, resurrected uh, peter gilder's uh, colonial war games uh, rules got them all put together from various sources and uh, play tested and republished uh, under the name sands of sudan so we're going to talk to carlo and as we always do we'll chat about gaming in australia big gaming and then we'll get on to the story of peter gilder's sudan rules so until then see you